The committee will come to order. Without objections, all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. This morning, the committee will hear from officials from the State Department, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the Defense Department about American efforts to prom promote democracy, sustainable development, and regional stability in Africa. Let me just shut this off. This is always the way it is. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, how the administration is working across agencies to achieve our goals. Welcome to our witnesses. Uh, thank you all for your time and your service, and welcome to members of the public and press as well. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, one of our biggest policy challenges in sub-Saharan Africa is figuring out how to help stabilize fragile states and reduce violence. Over the past 20 years, we've ha learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. We know that it requires strategic vision, it takes adequate long-term funding, and it takes coordination across the United States government. Mr. McCall and I recently reintroduced the Global Fragility Act to promote this approach. Our bill would make sure relevant agencies are working closely together over the long term to address state fragility and to prevent violence and extremism in priority countries and regions around the world. This would be the top American goal in these countries, not a second or third tier objective. My concern is that the administration is taking an unbalanced approach, favoring security-focused responses instead of getting to the root causes of instability, which would prevent the need for military involvement down the road. We've seen a number of cases in where lip service has been paid to good governance and respect for human rights, but in practice, we've shed an approach based on our values and instead uh, gone after long-term solutions. Take Uganda, for example, one of the country's main security partners in sub-Saharan Africa, one of our country's main security partners, a country where we should have leverage, yet authorities there have ramped up repression and violence against opposition politicians and civil society. After three decades in power, Museveni is tightening his grip as the United States response is reduced to reiterating requests to stop arresting and torturing anyone who dares to oppose the government. And we have yet to see a change in Uganda's trajectory. Or the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. In January, the United States endorsed clearly fraudulent election results simply because the administration didn't believe the opposition leader, who actually won, could ever take office. What message does it send when the United States refuses to stand up for democracy, when the United States refuses to call out this sort of corruption? Ironically, making regional security a top priority above all else ultimately undermines long-term stability on the continent. It's a failure of leadership and compounded by the administration's attempts to gut diplomacy and development. We have talked about that here. You can't conduct good diplomacy and good development if you're gutting uh, these programs and gutting uh, money to the State Department and, and, and looking at it as a second or third tier priority, it sends a message. It sends a bad message. It sends a message to the agencies best poised to grapple with these challenges that they are not a priority. It sends a message to the rest of the world that the United States is ceding ground to any other power that wants to put down roots. And you can bet that message is being heard loudly and clearly in Moscow and Beijing. In Sudan and South Africa, Russia is already using the same playbook they used to attack the United States in 2016 to spread disinformation. Kremlin-aligned private military corporations are gaining a foothold in the Central African Republic, Chad, which may be a precursor to similar Russian military involvement across the continent. China now has a military base in Djibouti, making it the only country in the world that hosts both a Chinese and an American military base. Talk about hedging your bets. China also has been actively exporting surveillance technology to African governments as a direct threat to open <coughs> civic and political space that is already quite fragile in some countries. And there are a number of hotspots across sub-Saharan Africa that deserve our immediate focus. At the top of the list is Sudan, 
since December, Sudanese citizens have peacefully protested against the government's repression and mismanagement of the economy. In mid-September, Sudanese security forces seized power from Omar al-Bashir, ending three blood-soaked decades in power. But despite calls from the African Union and other partners, including the United States, the Transitional Military Council has not been responsive to protesters' demands for an immediate transition to a civilian government. Earlier this week, at least eight protesters were killed by government security forces, and the longer this standoff between the military and the protesters lasts, the greater the threat for widespread violence and greater destabilization. I urge the administration to keep working with other diplomatic partners to encourage and incentivize an immediate transition to a civilian-led government in Sudan. I'm also deeply concerned about the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's now surpassed 1,600 cases. The United States has supported the Congolese government's response, but poor access, distrust of the government, and attacks against healthcare workers have hindered efforts to identify and treat cases. I have to mention, when we invest strongly in global health, we're better able to mount a response and help both DRC and surrounding countries, like South Sudan and Rwanda, build their capacity to prepare for future outbreaks. That's why it's so baffling when the administration sends up budgets requesting deep cuts to these efforts and uses bad tactics to delay and deny funding against congressional intent. So I'd like to hear our witnesses' answers on this range of issues. I look forward to a frank discussion. I'm going to introduce our witnesses, but first I will yield to our <laughs> ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas, for any opening remarks he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the United States has been a long and consistent partner with many African nations. Successful initiatives such as PEPFAR, the President's Malaria Initiative, uh, Feed the Future, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation have already saved millions of lives, created jobs, and spurred economic growth. Just last month, I traveled to Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, Tunisia, with Senator Lindsey Graham, where we helped launch the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative. This initiative will provide workforce development and skill uh, training, expand access to capital for entrepreneurs, and remove barriers to women's participation in the economy through microfinancing. Some of the fastest growing um, economies in the world are in Africa, and it's the fastest growing population as well. Uh, with a growing number of middle-class consumers. This means new markets uh, for U.S. companies and new opportunities to partner uh, with the United States. Uh, however, countries must have a clear-eyed approach on how this growth is being achieved and who they are partnering with. Between 2000 and 2017, China loaned African countries $143 billion for infrastructure projects. China views Africa's growth as an opportunity for geographic and ideological expansion through their Belt and Road Initiative, which preys on developing nations, leaving them largely in debt traps. The United States must provide a better alternative to China's exploitation. I have met with African governments and ambassadors and business leaders, and they all tell me the same thing, that the U.S. is their preferred partner but we are just simply not there. As Ambassador Nagy, you and I just discussed uh, prior to the hearing. The United States brings quality, transparency, and partnership, but we, we must show up to the, to the game to compete. And that's why my bill, the Championing Business Through Diplomacy Act, um, American business, is so important. I think it helps ensure that uh, the state better supports American companies of all sizes looking to invest in Africa and elsewhere, bring prosperity and, most importantly, stability. Uh, the chairman and I introduced the Global Fragility Act, which I think is a very important bill to help stabilize a destabilized continent, particularly when you look at the Sahel, which the Department of De Defense, as Ms. Uh, Linehan knows very well, uh, the Sahel is going to be the next hot spot, I think, for uh, if we can't do the prevention piece right, and then we have to send in the military. And I think the 
Global Fragility Act's a good playbook for the Department of, of Defense to look at how we can prevent extremism so we don't have to go in and, and kill. Now, the Build Act that uh, uh, Mr. Yoho introduced <clears throat> is a profound, significant piece of legislation uh, that will put OPEC on steroids and I think economic investment and an opportunity uh, from the private sector. Um, in line with my legislation, I applaud the administration for their work on Prosper Africa to increase two-way trade with African countries. The United States also plays an important role supporting good governance and democratic values on the continent. We must continue uh, working with countries to combat corruption and respect human rights. In Ethiopia, <clears throat> we've seen a historic transition, and I commend the bold reforms by Prime Minister Abiy. In Sudan, the people have risked their lives to call for a civilian-led government and end to Omar al-Bashir's -Bashir, brutal regime. The U.S. must stand by the people of Sudan during this critical moment in their history. I know very well from my time as Chairman of Homeland Security that ungoverned and unstable places uh, become safe havens for terrorists to regroup and plan attacks and external operations. I'm deeply disturbed by the number of increasing uh, attacks targeting innocent civilians, including women uh, and children. The United States must continue to stand with our African partners in the fight against radical Islamist terrorism. And that is why proactive investments in security and development now will make the United States far safer in the long run. I'm also concerned the proposed reduction in U.S. Special Forces and Advisors in the Sahel is premature. My bill, the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Act, calls for an interagency approach to address these threats. I think these witnesses today have valuable insight into these challenges facing Africa. It brings together, you know, state, USAID, and defense, which is what our Global Fragility Act bill actually does, uh, in a interagency whole of government approach to address this uh, challenge that we have. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield. Thank you, Mr. McCall. <clears throat> Our witnesses this morning are Tibor P. Naj, Jr., Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Ramsey Day, USAID, Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for Africa, and Michelle Lenahan, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs. Once again, let me welcome you all and convey the thanks of the committee. I'll now recognize you each for five minutes to summarize your testimony. Let's start with <coughs> Assistant Secretary Naj. I hope I didn't mess up the last name too much. Perfect, sir, perfect. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall, members of the committee. <coughs> I am pleased to be joined here today by my colleagues from USAID and the Department of Defense. Our engagement across Africa is truly a team effort. I would also like to recognize the men, women, and families currently serving the American people across our missions in Africa and within our offices in Washington. <laughs> I am grateful to represent such a dedicated and talented group of public servants. When speaking to audiences, be they Americans or Africans, I often tell them that the best way to view Africa is through the windshield, not the rearview mirror. It is certainly a time of challenges and opportunities in Africa, and I look forward to sharing with you what we at the State Department are doing to advance U.S.-Africa foreign policy priorities. I spent the vast majority of my 32-year diplomatic career in Africa with postings in seven different countries, and I fell in love with the continent and its people. Since I assumed my current role last September, I have visited Africa three times with another trip planned next month. During my trips, I have engaged with government officials, business leaders, civil society, and average citizens in order to better understand each country and sub-region through a broad range of people and perspectives. As I said before this committee last December, the potential for increased engagement with Africa economically, culturally, and diplomatically is truly limitless. I am a firm believer that with every challenge there is opportunity and we must capitalize on our successes. We have seen significant positive signs in numerous areas that are important to recognize. Prime Minister Abiy in Ethiopia continues to impress and inspire with his leadership 
and we have seen progress in our relationship with Eritrea. President Lorenzo of Angola has demonstrated a commitment to fight corruption and to foster citizen responsive governance and dialogue that can and should be replicated elsewhere. Just six months ago, discussions about the Democratic Republic of Congo revolved around how to promote the will of the Congolese people in the face of a government trying to cling to power through unconstitutional means. By contrast, when Secretary Pompeo recently met with President Chisiketi of the DRC following the historic transfer of power, the new president's priorities were fighting corruption, strengthening governance, advancing human rights, and combating trafficking in persons. And we continue to watch the dramatic events unfold in Sudan, where for the first time in 30 years, a transition led by civilians representing the diversity of Sudanese society seems possible. To underscore the U.S. commitment to Africa, the administration announced a new Africa strategy in December 2018 to recalibrate our engagement with the continent. This strategy seeks to promote trade and commercial ties to increase prosperity in the United States and in African countries, counter radical Islamic terrorism and violent conflict, strengthen efforts to advance peace and security by prioritizing resources and promoting effective and efficient peacekeeping operations, and by supporting stability, democracy, good governance, and self-reliance. Ultimately, the success of this strategy would build on our strong relationships with individual countries, effective regional organizations, and most importantly, the people of Africa. One enduring issue that I believe will be most significant in setting the course for a more prosperous and secure Africa is harnessing the potential of Africa's tremendous youth bulge as a force for economic ingenuity and prosperity. Their education, training, and successful integration into the economic futures of their countries will create viable alternatives to the poverty that leads to violent extremism and despair. Looking ahead, the population of Africa is expected to double in just a few short decades, 2.2 billion people, of which over 60% will be under 25 years. The enormous potential of these young people creates a wealth of economic opportunities that will determine the continent's future. We are not the only international actor that is interested in Africa, and we are justifiably concerned about certain countries that seek to exploit the resources of African nations and subvert Africans' desire for democracy for their own economical or geopolitical advantage. As you will hear today, no other nation matches the breadth and depth of the United States' engagement on the continent or our earnest promotion of partnerships, sustainability, and self-sufficiency. We go beyond simply investing in Africa to investing in Africans. Africa is the dynamic continent of the future, and the direction it takes will have a major impact for good or ill, not only in Africa, but the rest of the world. As the subject of today's hearing suggests, this is not a role for the State Department alone. We must constantly evaluate our approach and ensure a proper balance between the three Ds. Properly aligning our diplomatic development and defense tools and resources is critical. Successful engagement and true partnership with the people and governments of Africa comes from this coordinated and fully integrated approach. I would like to thank the committee for your bipartisan support and engagement on issues in Africa. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Day. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate the commitment this committee has demonstrated to the continent of Africa. As USAID Administrator Mark Green always says, the purpose of foreign assistance should be to end the need for its existence. USAID supports the President's Africa strategy and is modernizing the way we do business. Our foreign assistance will help our friends on the continent achieve sustained economic growth and self-reliance to combat transnational threats. Given time limitations, I can't touch upon all of our work in every country, so I'll focus on some of the themes and situations at the forefront of our attention. On March 4, 2019, Cyclone E-Day brought devastation to Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Torrential rains covered nearly 900 square miles in water, an area roughly the size of New York City and Houston combined. More than 1,000 people lost their lives, and 3.5 million people are in desperate need of assistance. USAID quickly deployed a Disaster Assistance Response Team, or DART Team, which includes experts in health, food security, shelter, water, sanitation, and hygiene. To reach communities cut off by the storm, we requested the unique capabilities of the Department of Defense. 
The U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, provided airlift and logistics support with 73 flights and transported more than 782 metric tons of relief supplies. Just five weeks later, Cyclone Kenneth struck Mozambique, and USAID deployed a team to determine additional needs. The Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, declared an Ebola outbreak in August 2018. Health officials have recorded at least 1,700 cases, including over 1,100 deaths. The U.S. government deployed a DART team, which is coordinating with the DRC Ministry of Health, the World Health Organization, and key actors to support a unified response to the outbreak. The Ebola response remains a very high priority of the U.S. government. We also see threats to democracy. Rarely these days do authoritarian leaders oppose elections outright. Instead, they use sophisticated tools to bend elections to maintain their grip on power. We know that good governance, peace, and security can help unlock the vast potential of Africa. And across the continent, 34 countries have improved their governance performance over the last 10 years. And elections in Nigeria and Senegal earlier this year were largely free of violence. There are, however, threats to these positive trends. Some governments have worked to close space for independent civil society, media, and opposition parties. The last few years in Uganda and Tanzania have been marked by a closing of political space, which is likely to continue as both nations head towards elections. At the same time, there's been an unprecedented wave of social and political protests across Africa. In places like Sudan, citizens are standing up and voicing their demands. Learning from our experience in countries such as the DRC, Nigeria, and Kenya, we know that when it comes to democracy, development, and security, the approach must be holistic and balanced. This is why our resources focus on areas critical to advancing countries on their journey to self-reliance. And we will continue to support electoral processes and peaceful political transitions. We also work with major political parties on issue-based campaigns, the inclusion of women and youth, and provide training for media on election coverage. Through the Trump administration's Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, WGDP, Launched in February, USAID is working to promote women's economic empowerment in Africa. We know that supporting women from improving their land tenure rights to unlocking access to credit and employment can unleash their full economic potential. USAID is also embracing partnerships with the private sector like never before, reducing barriers to trade and investment and fostering linkages between American and African firms. The U.S. government's Prosper Africa initiative will enhance our effort in these areas. Prosper Africa mobilizes the full U.S. government toolkit of approaches, capabilities, and influence across 15 government agencies to double trade and investment between the U.S. and Africa. And USAID deeply values the leadership of Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for their sponsorship of House Resolution 1704, the Championing American Business Through Diplomacy Act of 2019. This resolution, which aims to promote American business abroad, is in direct support of the goals of Prosper Africa. Countering violent extremism is also a critical part of USAID's work in Africa. We engage government and civil society partners in their efforts to reduce radicalization, recruitment, and support to violent extremist organizations. For more than a decade, the U.S. government has pursued a coordinated 3D approach to the evolving terrorism threat on the continent. Regular coordination with the Departments of State and Defense, including AFRICOM, creates a space where we can determine how to use the U.S. government's diplomatic, defense, and development tools to their greatest effect. As we reflect on the challenges facing individual countries, it's important not to lose sight of the long-term positive shifts across Africa. The overall trends point towards democratization, economic growth, and development. And USAID remains deeply committed to the role we play with the Departments of State and Defense in advancing U.S. policy and national security objectives. Thank you for your con continued support of USAID's work in Africa, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. L Lenihan. Good morning, Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall, and esteemed members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today on democracy, development, and defense, rebalancing U.S. foreign policy with Africa, alongside my colleagues from state and USAID. I would also like to thank the women and men of the U.S. Department of Defense, whose talent, commitment, and sacrifice enable us to execute our policies and achieve our objectives in Africa and elsewhere. It is an honor to represent them. Africa is important to our national interests and will become increasingly so in the future. It is a complex security environment marked by great power competitor advancements and threats from terrorist groups, violent extremist organizations, illicit traffickers, and transnational criminal organizations. Major trends to include population explosion have the possibility of compounding these issues. Today's forum provides a key opportunity for us to highlight the U.S. government approach to advancing our foreign policy goals and addressing threats which we do together. 
DOD activities often seize the spotlight, but we are part of an integrated effort with state, USAID, and others contributing mightily with depth and breadth to affect objectives laid out in the 2018 US strategy for Africa. One, promoting prosperity, two, strengthening security, and three, striving for stability. Guided also by the National Security Strategy and the National Defense Strategy, DOD strives to advance US interests in Africa and deny others the ability to harm the United States and our partners. We do so primarily through partnership. First and foremost, that includes other US departments and agencies, as a primary mission of ours is to provide military support to diplomacy and development. The US response to Cyclone E-Day, as Mr. Day noted, devastated Mozambique and heavily impacted Malawi and Zimbabwe. It's a powerful example of DOD providing unique capability via airlift and logistics support to enable the delivery of critical aid in support of USAID's broader efforts. We also contribute DOD medical expertise. In East Africa and Nigeria, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research supports the PEPFAR initiative through advancement of HIV AIDS research and treatment of 340,000 patients. DOD is also poised to provide critical support to US government personnel stationed across the continent to ensure their safety in times of crisis and we apply pressure on terrorist networks to create time and space for development and diplomacy efforts to take hold. Additionally, we focus on our African <coughs> partners and help build their capacity with the goal of developing professional forces who respect human rights, adhere to the rule of law, and more effectively contribute to stability in Africa. Through engagement, we have a greater chance of affecting behavior and ensuring forces are accountable. Further, we work through international partners and organizations such as the African Union and United Nations, and we support African-led initiatives such as the G5 Sahel or the Multinational Joint Task Force to maximize our impact and collectively address our shared threats. We employ a variety of tools to achieve our security objectives, from defense institution building to force professionalization, training, equipping, assisting, advising, and more. Our efforts cover a broad spectrum. The department also champions the advancement and inclusion of women in security. By changing the gender dynamic at the table, in the field, and within communities, we can help break the cycle of violence and raise societies through the elevation of women. DOD is committed to implementing the 2017 Women, Peace, and Security Act and helping prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflict by increasing women's participation. For example, since 2017, our Special Operations Exercise Flintlock in the Sahel has included a Women, Peace, and Security Seminar to highlight the importance of women's leadership and women's civil society organizations encountering violent extremist organizations. DOD maintains a dynamic, episodic engagement with enduring impact and light footprint, and we contribute to a whole of government effort to advance prosperity, security, and stability in Africa in support of our national security interests. Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall, and honorable members, thank you again for this opportunity to discuss US-Africa foreign policy and our integrated US government approach. Thank you all very much. I'll now recognize members for five minutes each. All time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses, and I'll start by recognizing myself. I want to ask a question about Sudan. Uh, the administration's endorsement of fraudulent election results in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in January sent a strong message that in Africa, the United States values regional stability over adherence to democratic processes and principles. Looking at recent events in Sudan, it is clear that, that the Transitional Military Council, which seized power in mid-April, is trying to determine how much power the international community will let them retain. This is arguably why negotiations between the military and the protesters have stalled. Let me ask Ambassador Naj, can you tell me why civil society actors across the continent should believe the United States' commitment to the consolidation of democracy after what happened in the DRC? And can you pr promise this committee and the people of Sudan that the administration will not undermine a true democratic transition 
in order to cut a deal with the very institutions that are, that are responsible for Sudan's current political and economic malaise. Ambassador. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, events in Sudan are extremely dynamic. Uh, as a matter of fact, they are going almost moment by moment as our charge just a little while ago was convoked to the foreign ministry along with others uh, by the TMC probably to hear about the state of negotiations between the TMC and the umbrella group of the opposition. Uh, there's been considerable progress in the last couple of days. We are very encouraged. Tomorrow afternoon, we are hosting right here at the State Department a Friends of Sudan conference with delegates coming from around uh, the world, including the Africa Union, uh, Ethiopians as their chairmanship of EGAD to make sure that the international community keeps uh, pr uh, pressing for forward momentum on this. We are very encouraged with the events there. Uh, our charge is extremely engaged. Deputy Secretary had a phone call with the uh, leader of the TMC, General Burhan, a few days ago. A few weeks ago, right after the events really unfolded, I sent our Deputy Assistant Secretary to the region to have discussions. So actually, um, as of right now, things are looking up. Uh, horrible of the deaths. There appears to be a split within the armed forces. So we are fully engaged. We're engaging with our allies and friends. We're also holding uh, discussions, obviously, with our Gulf friends to make sure that there's a commonality of purpose in moving forward in Sudan. Thank you, sir. Let me uh, ask a question. I mean, Mr. Day, I think I'll ask it to you about Russia in Africa. <clears throat> there's a, a growing risk that uh, Russia could seize upon the successes of disinformation campaigns in the West and redeploy them to other parts of the world, <clears throat> including sub-Saharan Africa. Indeed, in recent months, news has leaked that Russia or Russian-aligned entities have attempted to assist the governments of certain African countries, namely Sudan and South Africa, to try to spread disinformation or discredit political opposition parties. <coughs> so, Mr. Day, let me ask you this. How is Russia's increasing use of disinformation, a threat to U.S. interests on the continent. Across the U.S. government, what is being done to push back against the growing trend of Russian aggression, actually, in sub-Saharan Africa? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's certainly an element that, uh, and a trend that we are uh, seeing across the continent, both Russia and China. Um, we're watching it very closely. Um, now, Russians' engagement on the African continent, I think, pales in comparison to China. So a lot of our attention has focused on uh, ensuring that our African partners are aware of the risks of, uh, of engagement with China, given the, uh, the debt structure and the deals that, that have been done. Um, but uh, we're certainly concerned with disinformation, whether it be in South Africa or Sudan or any, anywhere. Uh, and so we continue to work with our African partners to ensure that, that there's a certain level of awareness uh, of the risks of those engagements. Anyone else care to comment, Mr. Uh, Ambassador? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. We are weaponizing our embassies to confront the Russians. I mean, we all know that for the Russians, this is nothing new. This is the same type of disinformation the Soviet Union conducted back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. We have to confront them at their source. We have to engage with our local interlocutors. Our em embassy public diplomacy sections have to be aggressive. And we're using the Young African Leaders Initiative Network, which is several hundred thousand bright young Africans, uh, to help us fight this disinformation, sir. Thank you. Um, let me um, call on Mr. McCall. But let me also uh, say that um, next week uh, the House is going to vote on the Global Fragility Act, which both Mr. Call and I are sponsoring, uh, establishing an overreaching policy framework for long-term interagency planning. And I hope that in your answering some of the other questions, you can sort of work that in. Thank you, Mr. McCall. No, no thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a great segue. I was going to ask you just that question. Uh, you. you know, when I talk to, uh, when I get the threat briefings, um, whether it be DOD or state, um, it, it, intelligence community, the Sahel seems to be the new, uh, can be the new hotspot. I mean, Iraq and Syria, we've, uh, I think we've tampered down the threat there. It's still alive, but it, it's uh, certainly been um, 
crushed to a large extent, and it seems that the Sahel is a hot spot. Um, that's why the Global Fragility Act, I think, is so important. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, I know the national strategy, as you mentioned, Ms. Linehan, sort of outlines what our bill authorizes. Um, the Re Relief and Recovery Fund will authorize $1 billion over five years. So with the three of you here, you're really the three principles of the Global Fragility Act. How, how would this actually work in action? And I'll start with you, Ambassador. Yes, sir, um, Mr. Ranking Member. I, I have to say that uh, from our point of view, we are absolutely delighted with the cooperation that we have between the three of us. We work very closely together. Uh, we meet constantly discussing policies. Of course, at times we see things differently, but, but overall we always have the same goal. The, uh, there are some examples of this, the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, where we're having meetings next week amongst all agencies involved is, is an ideal. And that is exactly how we need to work in situations like the Sahel, because it's, uh, it's multi-thread, it's historical, it's cultural. There, there are so many players involved, including Europeans and the United Nations. So the United States of America has to have a single force. And, and as has been evident, uh, situation after situation in Africa, uh, we can fight hard, eradicate uh, terrorism, but if there's not, nothing to fill that space, all you end up with then is after a few years, even a worse group of terrorists. Mm -hmm. Another partnership, which is absolutely essential in that situation, are the countries involved. And that's where also our diplomacy really matters because out of the five, six, seven countries, you can have six countries very strongly together. All it takes is one, which is not heavily involved and responsible to keep spreading what I call a cancer. So from, from our point of view, Bravo, and thank you, sir. Well, and the, the chairman and I introduced the Trans-Sahara Partnership Act. It'll be on the floor next week, I, I believe. So uh, that's very good. Mr. Day? No, I, I, I couldn't agree more with the Assistant Secretary. I, you know, from USAID's perspective, um, we need space to operate. And where, when we can gain access uh, to certain areas, um, uh, it's been proven that our, our programs can be effective, whether it's food security or education, <clears throat> some of our resilience programming, health, um, good governance, all of those are incredibly important to building kind of a holistic approach to this. But if we don't have access to it, then it makes it a lot more difficult. It means our programs are going to be a lot more limited. We can do a tremendous amount with our Office of Transition Initiatives, um, which is where we're working in northern Burkina Faso and, and Mali and some areas in, in Niger, uh, in Tilabari area. But it, it's incredibly important that we have great coordination amongst the, the various agencies because that gives us the space to operate. Um, because these programs will work. Um, but in, we just need to have the space to operate, similar in, in Somalia and several other places as well. Ms. Linehan. Thank you, Ranking Member. I agree with my colleagues in the panel. Uh, fragility is a serious concern within Africa. From a defense standpoint, you need to get at the underlying issues rather than just address the security effects. Um, and for that matter, you have to work on development. You have to work on develop, uh, diplomacy. We take steps in order to create time and space in order to do that and work in support of our interagency partners in order to do so. So any attempts to address underlying issues and causes certainly will have uh, spillover effects on improving security and reducing the need for it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my time is kind of limited, but I, I do want to address China real quickly. Um, the chairman mentioned his opening statement, uh, Djibouti. I mean, the idea that they have a military base right next to ours in Djibouti is, is just, um, to me, unacceptable. And, and this one belt, one road, they are literally, um, um, they're taking over African nations without a shot fired, uh, in my judgment, over leveraging them, bringing in their workers, extracting natural resources. I met with the conservation group yesterday. The Chinese are coming in with AK-47s and, and harvesting, you know, rhinos. Um, uh, so, uh, it, it just seems to me we're not comp we're not there. We're not competing in Africa, and if we're not there and we're not competing, and our American businesses are not competing, we lose. I, 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 Ambassador, you seem to want to respond to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Up to now, maybe not, but oh my gosh, we are we are getting ready to fire back at full force because we're going to do this strategically. 
Uh, we, again, I hate to use the word weaponize, but we're weaponizing our embassies to confront the Chinese across a whole range of, of issues, and most prominently the commercial one. Because as, as you said, sir, the Africans tell us over and over and over again, they would much rather deal with you as businesses than the Chinese, but they've been dealing with the Chinese because the Americans haven't been at the door. So we're going to change that. I mean, I could go on forever on this, but I just promise you that we are seized, the Secretary is seized, and, we, and you're going to see a very aggressive posture in so many different fields. Every time I go to Africa, I get in trouble with the Chinese for my speech as to where the Chinese ambassador in Uganda had to do a full page op-ed in response to the things I said, because I, I, I say the truth about what we're doing and what, where, what they're doing. Thank you, sir. I'd say, Mr. Chairman, in closing, it, it's been a very a, a, a slow creep and very deceptive, but I think people are waking up to what's happening now, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McCall. It's now my, my pleasure to call on the, uh, the chair of the uh, Africa subcommittee of this committee, Ms. Bass. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate the uh, ranking member in saying that people are beginning to wake up because you know, whenever I hear about the Chinese or the Russians in Africa, um, you know, my thought is, where are we? And, you know, it's time for us to step up. And so I appreciate the Assistant Secretary saying that um, you're going to come full force. I, I would love to hear the details as to what that means. And then, of course, what concerns me about it is, is that, and I know you are genuine because I know you, uh, but then, you know, we have a 66% decrease in the budget. So I don't know how you go full force and have your budget, you know, uh, decrease so much. So perhaps you can clue me in on the secret as to how you're going to do that. Um, and I appreciate Ms. Uh, Linehan uh, talking about addressing the root causes because I am concerned about our imbalance in that we put a lot more uh, emphasis. Obviously, we put emphasis on security, but we all recognize that if you address the root causes, you're addressing you know, uh, the security situation as well. So perhaps, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind, maybe, um, Assistant Secretary, you could give me some top lines as to how it'll be full force. Uh, I also want to ask about um, uh, Cameroon and Ethiopia, so I don't want to run out of time. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman. Very quickly, uh, I've worked for seven different administrations, different levels of budgets. Uh, I've had some fat ones and thin ones. All I, I can promise you that I will do the absolute best I can with whatever funds are made available. On China specifically, uh, we're having individual embassy and country strategies. We are putting deal teams together from the largest embassies to the smallest ones to do to both, both sides of this. Support U.S. businesses, work with the countries to improve their business environment, which will attract U.S. businesses. Because all my discussions with U.S. business, they said, we want to go to Africa, but this is what's stopping us. So again, that's a full force press. And also to make clear to people you know, every time China builds a 50,000-seat stadium, they get full-page coverage, front page. What is not said that there wouldn't be people to be in that stadium if not for U.S. government's billions of dollars saving millions of Africans from HIV-AIDS. So, so we need to make sure that both sides of the story is told on this. And I'll stop so, there for your Sure, time. and I know with my uh, ranking member over there um, that we'd love for you to come to the subcommittee and perhaps we could drill down because we want to figure out how to be uh, how to be supportive, uh, Ms. Linehan? Would you like to respond to the what you were saying in terms of addressing root causes, but yet um, our focus is on security? Thank you, Representative. I do believe that we need to address root causes. I also note from the Department of Defense, we Ms. Linehan, can you pull the microphone just a little closer to your to your mouth? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, I do believe that we need to address root causes in Africa, which my colleagues here from USAID and state do a heroic job of doing so, along with the many people out in the field and within the department in order to do so. Um, additionally, at the State Department, I mean, sorry, additionally at the Department of Defense, we work on institution building, which I also believe addresses some of the root causes in order to create those critical foundations um, and promote governance across the Sahel. Of note, there's the Security Governance Initiative, which is focused on addressing a cross-cutting security sector improvements to develop governance and build institutions. Two countries, Mali you, and uh, Niger, are part of that. Thank you, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but I know I'm going to run out of time. So I wanted to ask, uh, uh, in terms of the crisis in Cameroon, uh, in the Anglophone region, uh, we know it's been worsening over the last 18 months. Uh, and so I wanted to know what we are doing, um, along with our diplomatic partners, 
to encourage uh, negotiation. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, Cameroon continues to be one of three countries that grieves my heart every night. I sat with President Bia a couple of months. What are the months. other two? Somalia and South Sudan. Oh, okay. I, I, I sat with President Bia a couple of months ago in, in Cameroon, and we told, he told me, you know, yes, we're interested in dialogue, and, but the government has done nothing to show for it. They've set up some Potemkin institutions which have not done anything. Uh, we continue to press forward with our, our allies. We had an Arias at the United Nations. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna run out. This is just terrible, five minutes. Uh, yes. But I gotta get to Ethiopia. Okay, so, you know, one, given, one, right. best news on Ethiopia. Yesterday, if you'd been at the State Department for our partnership forum on Ethiopia and seen the hundreds and hundreds of peoples there from the diaspora, from US business, yeah. and from the Ethiopian government, your heart would have melted. I, I, I kicked it off and I was just delighted because I knew we would get to this point. Uh, going forward, we are finding ways to support Ethiopia, but what they need now is jobs, 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 and that will be brought by the business investment. So we will do our best to promote that. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. You let me continue Thank on, you. Mr. Chair? No, oh, never mind. Ms. Bass, yes. I'll give you, you want an extra minute? See that? I offered it, and she didn't take it, so I, got the, I have the best of both worlds. Um, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to our distinguished uh, panelists. Thank you for your work. You know, I've been here since 1981. Every single presidential budget that has come up here is dead on arrival. Uh, President Obama cut tuberculosis by 20 percent. We put it back. He cut neglected tropical diseases by 20 percent. We put it back, and then some. Uh, so when I see a budget come up that has draconian cuts, uh, it's in a way not worth the paper it's printed on, uh, but I'm not sure why OMB insists on doing that each and every year. But every president has done that. Thankfully, Congress is a check, and we do, I think, get it right most of the time. Let me just say a couple of things. I think that we are balanced in many ways. Of course, there's always room for improvement. Uh, much of what started with President Bush PEPFAR, for example, I was the prime author of the reauthorization for five years. That was signed by President Trump. We're talking about $30 billion approximately over five years for tuberculosis, for HIV AIDS, and look at the progress that has been made through successive administrations. Beginning with Bush, his idea, one of his greatest legacies ever, 17 million Africans saved because of it. Mother to child transmission has saved about 2 million or so, and maybe more. And then you have the situation of about, what's it, 13 high HIV burden countries to run pace to control their HIV AIDS pandemic uh, by 2020, according to Ambassador uh, Deborah Burks. So there's real progress being made, and as you said, Mr. Ambassador, uh, they may build a stadium, they be in the Chinese, which is high gloss and highly visible, but we are saving lives, and you are walking point saving those lives. And I don't think that should be in any way trivialized uh, or, or in any way denigrated. It is fantastic what you're doing. So there has been continuity from administration to administration, and it continues. I can't think of a better person to be running um, uh, our USAID than Mark Green. I, I got along great, worked great with uh, Dr. Shah, who I thought was a great USAID administrator, and the two that followed, including the interim. And now that baton has been given to a very, so I, I do hope that you know, the press and others, when they walk away, so much is happening on the ground. The Ebola, if you would elaborate quickly on what's happening in DR Congo and Ebola. Uh, the situation is very, very discouraging, uh, but you can fill us in on that. Um, Karen Bass and I visited Ethiopia uh, last year and met with President Abe, uh, and we're very encouraged by his release of political prisoners. You might want to elaborate very quickly on that. Uh, and then Turkey. You know, we talk about China. I chaired several hearings on China's influence on what's happening uh, in, in Africa. Uh, their fleecing of their minerals, their wood, their other uh, oil, uh, and their debt now, which is a huge problem. You might want to speak to that quickly. Uh, trafficking, we're doing wonderful work, I think, at the trafficking office and in our embassies on combating that hideous scourge of modern day slavery. Thank you for that. I don't think that gets enough uh, focus or coverage. And I would respectfully ask that this committee mark up a bill that I've been trying to get passed for some time, uh, the End Neglected Tropical Disease Act, um, which Karen Bass and I have uh, co-authored, and Gregory Meeks, bipartisan bill, a billion people plus walking around with worms and parasites, very low-cost interventions. We're spending $100 million 
to, to, to combat that. We need to get a mentality like PEPFAR to fight that as never before, because co-infections and opportunistic infections obviously thrive on the weakness when somebody's walking around with worms in their intestines, over a billion people. So, Mr. Chairman, I would ask if we could bring that up um, uh, as soon as possible, respectfully. Perhaps uh, uh, I'll just speak uh, very quickly on, on Ebola. Uh, we're deeply concerned. We should all be concerned about the Ebola outbreak in eastern DRC. It is not contained and it is not under control. Um, this is no longer a public health crisis. It's a political challenge as well as a development challenge. There are layers of complexity that are occurring simultaneously. Um, we have extremist organizations that are working within the areas. There, there are community militias. There is deep community distrust. Um, a whole range of complexities in terms of the operating environment. So our priorities are to first contain uh, the outbreak, control the outbreak, and ultimately end the outbreak. Now we're working in kind of four primary areas uh, of approach. One is to ensure we have the most effective vaccine strategy possible. Two is to address the community distrust issues through, via community engagement programs, but then also making sure that we are coordinated with the, the, uh, the, the DRC political um, structures, including President Chisichetti, um, working with the international organizations, including the, w, the World Health Organization, as, include, as well as the U.S. government coordination, which is our primary partner, is the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. Um, and then, of course, we've got to work on preparedness of the RIN countries, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, uh, and Uganda. So um, we need a reset on this, and we're working on a reset plan because we've seen a real um, increase in the number of cases over the last month. So it's a concerning issue. On Ethiopia, sir. Yes, uh, Prime Minister Abiy continues to make dramatic, dramatic uh, reforms, uh, very focused on the elections, uh, working with the opposition to make sure that the election timetable is right. There are fissures, as we all know, in Ethiopia, which have been under the surface for decades, which are going to be coming out, and it's a troubling situation for him. So far, everything is well under control. And of course, there are serious opposition to his reforms within uh, certain segments of the Ethiopian government. He needs support because he's doing one of the most dramatic things possible is converting Ethiopia into a country that will be based on institutions, which I think is very, very dramatic. And we're doing our best to help him with that, with sending technocrats at the institutional level. But more than anything, as I mentioned, he really needs jobs, jobs, jobs for his young people, sir. We do talk about China a lot. I know my time is up, but if you could, for the record especially, speak to what Turkey is doing vis-a-vis -vis the Horn of Africa, because it's a very serious problem. Well, yes, sir. If I can ask you to um, keep the answer short, because we have to call on other people. Thank you. Very quickly, yes, the Turks are very involved for business purposes. They are also involved in the uh, airport in Mogadishu and in dr doing some, uh, some training. Of, of the Somali National Army, and we would like to see what the effectiveness is, and we would like to cooperate and coordinate closer. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We touched on a lot of uh, important issues, the empowerment of women, uh, the threats from China, Russia. Uh, but I want to touch on another one. Uh, we did talk about the, the Sahel. Uh, we talked about uh, the complex challenges that are there. But there's one that's a threat multiplier that concerns me, and that's the effect of climate change as a threat multiplier. Uh, they really intensify a lot of those problems, the instability that's there, the effect of land degradation, food, food insecurity, and resource distribution, their source of their incubators, the, it's an incubator of conflict as well from a stability uh, and security standpoint. So uh, I want to know what uh, we have been doing on that to try and deal with adaptation to the climate change, what resources we have, how we've prioritized this important issue. Sure. Thank you, Congressman. I, I agree it is, is it's absolutely a critical issue. USAID's approach uh, primarily is to focus on the consequences uh, of a changing climate and, and extreme weather events. So if we can build more resistant uh, local communities, then they are going to be um, much more capable of addressing many of those challenges. So that is everything from food security um, to uh, resilience programming, which we've done all across, all across the continent, particularly on the Horn of Africa and Sahel. So a lot of our programming is 
um, engaging the local community to ensure that there's uh, local governance engagements, um, but also working with um, everything from local farmers to educational institutions to ensure that um, food security um, and, and their ability to uh, to be resilient in these types of environments is is uh, is increased and maintained. Ms. Linehan, uh, could you comment more on the security and military side of that from your perspective too? Because climate change, it, it really impacts that as well. Thank you, Representative. There's certainly some environmental effects occurring in the Sahel. We see uh, increased tension between, say, farmers and herders over absence of, of water and just uh, concern for, for resources. But I'd also like to highlight work that our AFRICOM is doing primarily in the logistics shop in the J4 in order to work with partners to improve their abilities. For instance, in Burkina Faso, there is a program in order to work on uh, water sanitation and hygiene to make the most of what they're doing. Also, through some of their efforts, they're helping bring the military and that military expertise into a larger whole of government effort in order to address some of those climate issues. Yeah, I was struck recently, I was in part of the uh, Munich Security Conference hearings, and I was struck by how much discussion was going on about EU's partnership in Africa. Can you comment on that? And one of my uh, beliefs is we could multiply our efforts too by working closer uh, with those European efforts since we share so many of the same values and concerns. Uh, can't we do a better job of working together? Can you comment on what they're doing, how we can work with them in a concerted way uh, to really be more effective, particularly when we're dealing with uh, the Chinese and the Russians trying to deal with that area? I'll be happy to talk on the political side because uh, we have very close coordination with the G7, which is uh, Europeans plus Japan. We meet on a regular basis to uh, compare, coordinate our policies across Africa. Uh, at the country level, most of our ambassadors belong to what are called uh, local donor groups, where they sit locally. Again, mostly it's uh, with EU and other major donors to make sure that there's uh, as least as possible duplication of effort on their programs. Uh, having sat in donor groups myself, it's astounding what you can find out at the local level because the capitals often don't talk to each other. So uh, you can really use your resources in a yeah, much wiser yeah. way. But also, you know, avoiding duplication. What about uh, policy of consolidating those efforts and concentrating those efforts more? Is there discussions on that? I just think there's a tremendous opportunity for us. There, I do know there is in certain circumstances. For example, with the dramatic changes in Ethiopia, that's one of the things that our like-minded missions did, was to get together to see how quickly each could respond to the various needs of the Ethiopian government. Uh, one big example is one thing they needed was direct budget support. The United States of America does not write checks in most instances and just gives them to, uh, to governments. The Europeans were able to do that to a certain extent. Is so, part of this though uh, also inoculating some of the countries, you mentioned Ethiopia, about what China is doing with these uh, type of uh, loans? These, you know. At the last G G7 meeting, sir, I can assure you that China was a very hot topic of discussion. All right. And Representative, yes. I'd add from a security standpoint that we work quite closely with our European counterparts and colleagues. When the European Union has training missions in multiple areas of, of Africa, which complement our efforts. Additionally, we provide support to the French uh, for CT operations in the Sahel under the authorities granted by Congress, which has a force multiplying effect. Further, in Somalia, one of DOD's primary roles is actually as a coordination facilitator that we have is something called a Mogadishu coordination cell with headed by a one star which serves to actually coordinate all of the international um, defense capabilities in order to reduce duplication and ensure greater effectiveness. Yeah. Thank Gentlemen. you very much. I think we could do the same type of thing in, in the economic sphere uh, that we are in the security and defense sphere in, in that respect, you know, working together uh, as a multiplier. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keating. Mr. Yoho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Um, I don't know where to start. There's just so much going on. But I hear the, the same thing we've heard over for the last three years, and I'm glad China's come to the forefront of what they are doing around the world and that people are paying attention to that. And you know what? China is going to continue to do what they've been doing. You know why? Because they can. They have the cash to do what they're doing. We had a space program in the 60s when we had a, uh, our mandatory spending was about 30 percent, discretionary was 70, 
We could do a space program. We could do interstate programs because we had the cash. China can do that. And this is a, a, a call out to this body, not just the Foreign Affairs Committee, but to Congress in general, the House and the Senate. If we do not get our fiscal house in order, this is going to continue and China is going to eat our lunch about. And the other thing that China does is China provides no string financing, unlike Western countries, um, with no conditions on uh, fine points such as human rights, clean governance, the things that we believe in as we try to promote democracies. I've not been a big fan of promoting democracies. I think our focus should be on stable governments. If you have stable governments, you have better governance, and then you can start bringing an economy this way. And I think we just really need to have an honest conversation in here about our fiscal irresponsibility as a body, and it's, it's tragic that we're not doing that. Um, moving on, Africa still faces tremendous electricity uh, access challenges. China, China is heavily engaged in the African power sector with investments of $13 billion between 2010 and 2015. Do you believe that the U.S.-based programs like Power Af Africa are competitive enough against China increasing engagement on the continent, specifically in energy and development, uh, the, the development sphere? Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, I think Power Africa really has been a successful model, and I think we've learned a lot from our experience in past Power Africa. Um, Power Africa has facilitated over 120 transactions, almost $20 billion, um, and there are 58 million people on the African continent now who have electricity who did not have that before uh, the initiative started. I think if you wrap that into a larger package, um, as we roll out the more details about the Prosper Africa initiative, which will be kind of multi-sectoral, uh, an effort to really coordinate all of the U.S. government toolkits to support uh, private sector engagement on the African continent, then I think we can get to the scale that I think you're talking about there. Yeah, we've, we've had some real success on the power side with Power Africa, but Prosper Africa is an umbrella effort to, to really support American businesses on the African continent. And I, this I, is us coming to the table. I appreciate you bringing that up. And you said something in the beginning that I feel with. You should work yourself out of a job. That's right. If we're successful in our foreign aid policies, you know, you've passed the, the, the baton off to that country because they have become self-sufficient. Uh, the bulk of um, the money that we put in there, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has generally received between 20 and 20, 25 percent of the total U.S. bilateral aid, the bulk of which supports health programs. We were in the Congo with Chairman Royce and Chairman Engel uh, a couple years ago, and we were at the cabinet meeting with President Kabila, who couldn't find the time to meet with America, but his cabinet did. And this was a, um, a rhetorical question I asked, but it was shocking on how rapid the response was. I asked him, what are you doing for social programs? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, health, education, um, you know, housing, uh, you know, hunger. He goes, we have you. You know, that's not sustainable. We have got to work with the countries like um, the Sudan and Ethiopia how do you find countries willing to come along and the ones that are, do we really run and push a lot of effort with these people to build their countries and government? Sure. Thank you for the question. This is something that we are um, uh, having many, many discussions about. And the administrator has been, laid out a vision that we call the journey to self-reliance, which is really looking at the level of commitment and the level of capacity uh, in our host country, host country partners. And those countries that have not demonstrated a significant level of commitment, our relationship will ultimately, from a, from a development perspective, will ultimately shift. I've got to add one more yeah. question in here. If Congress, meaning the House and the Senate, fails to fund the BUILD Act or the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, as intended by Congress, and the administrators can't prepare, allowing the administrators not to prepare for the massive rollout that everybody's anticipating for October 2019, how detrimental will it be to our foreign policies in the future? It will be significant. We are uh, very, very excited about the DFC coming operational on October 1. From, from a USAID perspective, uh, this is an incredibly important tool to engage the private sector on the African continent. Ambassador Naj? A absolutely essential. That is one tool that I've been pointing out in all my visits around the continent and speeches to U.S. business is they're so excited about that. 
because I can't order U.S. business people to go to Africa. That's why I tell African governments, put in place a business environment that will welcome U.S. business because they're eager to go. But the Build Act will be very important. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Baer. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm glad um, my colleague from Florida, Mr. Yoho, brought up implementation of the Build Act. And as um, Chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight, we want to make sure it's implemented and rolled out in the most effective way. So um, we will be looking at that and, and, and making sure that implementation gives you the full, full tools necessary. Um, you know, I was in West Africa last summer. Um, I actually wanted, I'm a doctor by training with a public health background. I actually wanted to go to um, the, the western part of the DRC when that outbreak w was going on. But for risk tolerance, they wouldn't let me go there. So we went to Sierra Leone instead to kind of get a sense of you know, what we learned from the 2014 outbreak. And on that category of risk tolerance, you know, the, the one thing I worry about, and again, I'm thinking about this as a doctor and public health um, specialist. Um, Mr. Day, you a a absolutely pointed out what's happening in Eastern Congo is getting worse, and it's rapidly getting worse. And you know, talking to health workers who and, and our workers from CDC who have been in country recently or currently are in country, um, it is difficult to address this without actually being at the epicenter and, and providing supervision. And, you know, it, I, I guess my question maybe to Ambassador Naj um, would be what is that, that I don't want to put our personnel in harm's way, but I also understand if we can't get close enough to the epicenter, maybe going in and out, this rapidly can get out of control. And, and maybe for um, Ms. Um, Lenhan, is there a role for our, you know, outside of diplomatic security, additional DOD security, et cetera? I don't know, maybe Ambassador Naj. Yes, sir. The, the risk is something we've looked at very, very carefully and had our experts look at it to see where effectively we can be stationed, for example, to do the, the most that we can. Uh, some NGOs have a much higher risk tolerance than we do. Our ambassador, if we let him, would have a much, much, much higher risk tolerance. He's, he's that kind of a person, so we have to literally hold him back because everybody is so keenly, keenly uh, just intent to, to put a stop to this because the dangers are immense, you know, going off in different directions, crossing borders of countries that could not be able to deal with it. So, so we're extremely seized with this, but the risk for American personnel definitely takes priority. Thank you, sir. Sure, and I, I would just add that um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned kind of the short-term capabilities of being able to get into some of the more hot spots. Uh, the, the primary population centers have been Beni, Batembo, and Katwa. Um, our head of the Democracy Conflict and Humanitarian Assistance, uh, Admiral Zemer, was just there last week. So we are able to kind of get in on short term um, and to do quick assessments. Um, but the WHO is actively working in many of those areas. So they have roughly around 400 or so personnel that are there. Um, but I agree with the Assistant Secretary. The, the operating environment right now has got conducive for long term USG. And, 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 and I appreciate that. And you know, from the folks that have been in country that we've been interacting with, they do think there's that possibility of sending some of our folks in for a day or two at a time and pulling them out so they can oversee you know, how the, the workers that are in these hot spots are actually doing it, give them advice, et cetera. But, you know, and maybe it, it is that in and out darting of, of you know, um, providing supervision. Not, not um, ideal, but may, maybe what we have to do. Ambassador Naj, you touched on something that I hear increasingly from our foreign service officers and our ambassadors around the world, kind of in this post-Benghazi environment of diplomatic security and embassy security, we've pulled a lot of our personnel behind walls and, and so forth. And these men and women who are truly patriotic out there, um, understanding that there, there's risk, yeah, I almost feel like we've overcorrected because where we used to be out with the people interacting on a daily basis, now you see the Chinese and others, and I hate to see us building these embassies with big walls, and our, our, our men and women want to be out there, and again, I don't know the right answer of risk tolerance, but I want to make sure we haven't overcorrected and 
hurt our diplomats and our development workers' um, ability to, to be most effective. Maybe if you well, could comment on Sir, that. having a son who's in diplomatic security, he and I have argued about this a lot because I'm the kind that wants to be out there when I was ambassador. You know, going to church, there was only one road, so that was the only choice I had. But each of our ambassadors takes a look at this very carefully. They're very competent, very professional. They adapt circumstances, sometimes based on the day of the week. So I, I personally am very comfortable that we have found that compromise. Okay. And from an oversight perspective, that's certainly something that we're going to be looking into, working with our diplomatic security personnel, but also making sure that our men and women that are out there representing our values in our country on a daily basis you know, can, can do their jobs as well. Thanks. Um, before I go to Mr. Kissinger, I, I did want to ask Ms. Linehan uh, a follow-up question from Mr. Yoho, which is the same question he posed to the other witnesses. If the BUILD Act isn't funded completely, what will the impact be from your perspective of DOD? Thank you for your question. Um, I defer to my colleagues here whose work is more closely focused on the BUILD Act and uh, will be in alignment with their answers. Thank you. Mr. Kissinger. Well, thank the chairman for yielding. Thank you all for being here. I very much appreciate it. Um, you know, post-conflict stabilization spans years. Democracy building takes longer. And sometimes in our society, we like to kind of see it all done immediately. And we forget our own history that, you know, we had a revolution and then a civil war and a lot of division. And uh, some people think that we're divided today, but compared to the past, it's nothing. And uh, so the deteriorating situation in Libya, I think, is proof of the time it takes. While the international community had high hopes for the 2011 transition plan, we've seen anti-government militias gain control of key resources and suffocate the UN-backed government. And I'm concerned with the current stability of Libya as well as the country's long-term health. Uh, as a result of the ongoing hostilities between the uh, LNA and the UN-backed government and national accord, we've seen the creation of the perfect environment where terrorist groups can flourish. So Ms. Linehan, how has the fighting impacted U.S. operations in combating the threat of ISIS and other terror groups in the region? And also, have we seen an uptick of ISIS fighters fleeing Syria and Iraq to regions in Libya? Thank you, sir. Um, we agree the situation in Libya is grave. We have concerns about the ongoing... Speak up just a little bit. Of course. We agree with the concerns about the situation in, in Libya and the ongoing instability as far as the impact, as well as the impact on other areas. Uh, we're in support from the Department of Defense on a political solution. That is truly the way forward in order to have long-term stability in Libya. Uh, we currently do not have forces in Libya conducting CT operations. Um, and as far as foreign terrorist fighters, we have not seen a serious uptick in return based on advances in the Middle East. But certainly that's something that we'll continue to follow closely out of concerns that that could occur. And can you talk about Egypt's role in combating terror on that shared border? So Egypt falls outside of my portfolio, so with all due respect, I'll defer. Any of you guys? Ambassador? Sam? Yeah, I get it. So let me, uh, let me transition then. Through the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, China made the uh, geostrategically geo significant country of Djibouti one of their first major initiatives. Through their debt trap diplomacy, a Chinese-owned company has taken control of the uh, container terminal and the adjoining multi-purpose cargo facility. What concerns me is that six miles away is America's largest military base in Africa, which is supplied through the now Chinese-operated port. Additionally, the PLA base in Djibouti, located adjacent to the port, has used military-grade lasers to interfere with American C-130s flying into the base. Uh, Ms. Linehan, how does the presence of a Chinese military base affect American operations across Africa and the Middle East? Sir, thank you for raising the question. In line with our national defense strategy, China is a strategic concern for the Department of Defense. Certainly with the advent of the Chinese base in close proximity to our own base at Camp Lemonnier creates some certain complications. We have to be concerned about safety and deconfliction and create mechanisms in order to manage that. Um, as we've noted before, China has an overall concern on the continent, and so what we continue to do is promote our model to ensure that we remain the preferred partner with um, our African partners and then also continue to eliminate some of the concerns about working with China overall. And let's say we reduce our role in, uh, in, there, in Africa in general or in that region. How would the Chinese react to that? And I'll ask that also of the ambassador. 
Sir, we maintain engagement from a DOD standpoint. We have a robust uh, activity of security cooperation across the region to include within the Horn of Africa and in Djibouti. So at present, okay. I expect I'll we'll let, continue that. Thank you. Ambassador, if, yeah, if yes, our role sir. decreases. Yes, sir. Thankfully, we're not reducing our role in Africa because the Chinese would be delighted if we right. reduced our role in Africa. I want to dramatically increase our role, especially on the business side. I, I want U.S. business people to be running over the Chinese business people instead of the other way around. And with the 50 seconds left, do you want to more generally kind of address China in uh, Africa? As a a whole? Absolutely. It is, uh, they are a strategic competitor. Um, for decades, U.S. business people have not been at the door and when the door was opened. That's why the African governments have been doing deals with the Chinese. Um, you know, we went through a debt uh, restructuring back in the 80s and we forgave a lot of debt and hopefully we don't have to get to that again where African governments will be looking to see how they can get out from under Chinese debt. You know, to trade one debt trap for another would be devastating for our African friends. Uh, and we get in you as businesses, you don't, you reduce corruption, you increase good governance, you have greater rights for women, you care more about the environment, and on and on and on. So uh, there, there are so many pluses and there'd be so many minuses with the U.S. ceding that territory, sir. Thank you. And I was pleased with the, uh, getting the XM Bank up and running, so I'll yield back. <laughs> Representative Castro. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. And thank you all for your testimony today. It's great to see that we're having a full committee hearing on Africa in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, for the longest time, certain parts of the world, including Africa, have gotten the out of sight, out of mind treatment. Uh, there are things that happen in Africa that if they happened in other parts of the world would get much more attention. Uh, we see once in a while cases where 50 people or 100 people are killed or are victims of a natural disaster, and that's a blip on American news media. Uh, and so let me ask you, there was some conversation here about making sure some of the countries after we have infused development monies into them for years are able to get back on their feet or get on their feet and establish their own economic strength. What are we doing to help those economies and their businesses? I know what we're doing to help U.S. businesses. What are we doing to help African businesses build their own capacity and export and become successful? Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, USAID has been active on the African continent for, for six decades. And this has been a big part of our area of focus for, uh, for pretty much that entire time. Um, many of these countries um, have been able to take advantage of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. Um, and so USAID has worked with a lot of African firms to prepare them and to build capacity so that they can actually export their goods via AGOA. Um, now, we, USAID works through our trade and investment hubs. Uh, we have three trade and investment hubs on the continent. Um, and so a lot of firms um, will come to those trade and investment hubs. We will work with them, build those capacities, and then make, uh, make business linkages back to the U.S. so that there's export opportunities for them. Sure. Yes, sir. I, I think AGO is one of those examples of uh, multi-political uh, projects that have been supported by both parties. Now the United States is strongly supporting the continent-wide free trade agreement, which uh, the AU has been sponsoring. It looks like it will be coming into force. And on the side of that, we would very much like to have a very first free trade agreement with an African country. We only have one free trade agreement as a as with Africa, and that's with Morocco. We would very much like to have a sub-Saharan one exactly to meet those interests, sir. Sure, and, and I would hope that we would do something to help them export to the United States and export to other countries. Uh, again, we want our American businesses to be successful, but if it's truly, if our development is truly about having countries get up on their own feet, you've also got to help their own economic infrastructure. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Day, what's happened to the USAID budget with respect to Africa in the last few years? The budget uh, has it gone up or down or flatline? Um, I think it's been a fluctuation, um, as always. I know the proposal was to take USAID down dramatically, uh, but I'm trying to remember specifically for Africa what happened. Uh, in 2018, uh, the non-security uh, outside of the international disaster assistance was roughly $8 billion. But, but how does that compare to 2017, 2016, 2015? Uh, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now, but it's, it has fluctuated back and forth over the last several years. Okay, uh, and then the second part of it is, is what are we doing to develop democracies on the continent? 
Sure. Uh, you know, the work that USAID, is, that USAID does all across the continent um, is centered on the core value of democracy because that's a reflection of American values and, and, and principles. So democratic principles are woven into essentially every program that we have on the continent, which is hundreds of programs across 40 countries. Um, and so democratic principles, whether it's electoral support or good governance, um, we work with governments when we can. Um, in some cases, we cannot, um, but w we work on electoral principles, we work with civil society, um, we work with media all across, the, all across the continent, we work with political parties, um, and so it is woven through all of our programs in all of our countries. Sure. Well, and again, I want to thank you for y'all's work and everything that you're doing. I know that you're doing it sincerely and earnestly. Uh, I just think that we have to avoid the temptation uh, to see these nations as only charity cases. Um, because I think that it, it undermines, I think, their humanity and who they are. Uh, and we have, to do, we have to be concerned not just with our own success and American businesses' success, which, I, of course, we all agree with, and we want to beat China out. Uh, I don't want China to have stronger relationships on the continent than we do. Uh, but I think the way that we do that is by affirming Africa and, and their nations and affirming their own capacity and building their own capacity. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for everything you guys are doing. We appreciate it. Representative Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I thank, thank our witnesses for, for their time and for their service to our country. Uh, Ms. Lenahan, I understand that Russia has been expanding its footprint in Sudan and is considering establishing a naval base near Port Sudan. But after months of protests against the autocratic regime, Russian-backed uh, Omar al-Bashir has been deposed in a peaceful coup. Will regime change in Sudan increase or diminish the likelihood of an enhanced Russian presence in Sudan, and how would this affect U.S. interests? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Russia also is a strategic concern for the United States, as outlined within the national defense strategy, and we do see increasing interest on the continent. In the context of Sudan, there certainly is a relationship. The situation is obviously very dynamic at present as far as what will occur within that country with the transitional military. Will the regime Council. change, uh, do you think, increase or diminish the likelihood of their enhanced Russian presence? I'd say it would be difficult to tell, but certainly once there's an established relationship, uh, that could be affected once that leader is gone. Uh, Ambassador Naj, Russia's actions in Sudan look a lot like its activities in Venezuela and Syria to me. What do you think Russians, Russians' intentions are, and what lessons should the U.S. draw from I, I, the Syria I, and Venezuela, uh, Venezuela uh, scenarios? Thank you very much, Congresswoman. I believe that Russia is very opportunistic in Africa. They don't have the resources of China. They certainly don't have the resources of the United States. They look for places where they can cause trouble, basically, and poke us in the eye, or as in the Central African Republic specifically, poke the French in the eye. We just have to be very careful and, and block wherever we can. With You, you asked about Sudan. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that if the transition in Sudan goes in the direction it does go in, we end up with a civilian-controlled government then they will have a totally different view of Russia than the government that they will be replacing. Uh, we absolutely are all hoping uh, for that. Mr. Day, I am so glad that you highlighted the centrality of women's empowerment in achieving sustainable development goals. Uh, education and economic empowerment for women have positive, positive ripple effects in developing countries all across the globe. I am particularly interested in efforts to reduce the gender gap in property ownership in sub-Saharan Africa, where the World Bank found that men are almost three times more likely than women to own property by themselves. This disparity has wide-ranging economic consequences for women and their, their daughters. Uh, can you tell me how USAID is working to reduce gender gaps in property ownership in sub-Saharan Africa? Thank you, Congresswoman. This is, uh, this is absolutely vitally important to Africa's development, so thank you for raising it. Um, it's also 
vitally important to many of the countries that I've worked in in my, yes. my career, um, including the Middle East. Um, but it's, it's probably even more so, I think, in Africa, in that uh, I sometimes say that, that these economies are not going to succeed if they only use half their brain, um, and I think that's never more true than in, than in Africa. And so women need access to not only land rights, but also education, um, and they need access to finance um, so that they can access markets, they need to be, have access to networks, um, but then also there's a regulatory and a policy and a legal and a cultural um, environment that needs to also be uh, that needs to be changed, and that's exactly what USAID is doing in the the, the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative (WGDP). Right. Um, so we're really looking forward to, to digging in our heels in the program. Well, let let me know how we can be helpful because I I, I see it as um, really the only way uh, forward, and the property ownership gap is uh, is outrageous. Yeah. Uh, at the moment. I have a little bit of time left. So, Mr. Day, Tanzania has long been considered a democratic success story. However, current president, John, uh, John Magufuli, I believe, uh, has begun to violate democratic norms in the name of eradicating corruption. Can you tell me how USAID is working to prevent democratic backsliding in Tanzania? Thank you again for the question, and, and as the Assistant Secretary and I have had numerous conversations about this, lamenting about the yes. developments in, in Tanzania, we are, we are deeply concerned about the rhetoric coming out of Tanzania, not only from a human rights perspective, but from a democracy perspective as well, um, and a business perspective, because there are a lot of American businesses who are um, waning their interest in, in Tanzania because of the developments there. Now, we have uh, continued to work on our health programming, uh, particularly PEPFAR, um, which is vitally important in Tanzania. Um, but a lot of our programming has really had to shift away from support and partnership directly with the government as a result of these developments. And we're now really focused more on civil society and independent media. And that's where we've shifted a lot of our programs. Well, I really hate to see the backsliding. And Ambassador Naj, I, I know I'm out of time, but I would be very much interested in your um, perspective on this too. And certainly I think our committee would. So um, either in, in writing or um, uh, perhaps would be, would, sure. would be best. V very quickly. Tanzania is especially sad because that was one of the beacons right. yep. of democracy through Africa's history yep. and decolonization. So it is, it is hurtful to the entire continent and the friends of Africa. And our embassy, believe me, is extremely engaged across the whole spectrum of interlocutors of making the point, uh, trying to promote democracy and also trying to help those organizations that are Tanzanian right. and are trying to hold on to democracy because there's a danger of it evolving into what we would call a Potemkin democracy, where you have the structures of democracy, but without anything really behind it. Well, the backslide is, is, uh, is, is just terrible. And uh, I appreciate the chair's indulgence and uh, for your tremendous service and work in the area. And uh, Representative Wagner and the subcommittee, we're probably going to take up some of these subjects again. And I, you I would look be forward welcome to, to it. Come. You bet. Um, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Good. And um, I would be very pleased. So I, I appreciate my friend uh, Ms. Bass's uh, invitation. Absolutely. Representative Liu. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for being here. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lenahan, for your public service, including your service in the Naval Reserves. I'd like to ask you first some questions about Libya. So Acting uh, Secretary of Defense Pat Shanahan has said that uh, he believes that a military solution is not what Libya needs. Would you agree with that statement? Thank you, sir. Um, I would say we need a political solution in Libya for long-term stability. Okay. On April 7th, Secretary of State Pompeo said, we have made clear that we oppose a military offensive by Khalifa Haftar's forces and urge immediate halt to these military operations against the Libyan capital. Would you agree with that statement? Sir, I'd note that we do agree a political solution is required in Libya. All right. On Friday, April 19th, there was a story that ran in the media. I'll just pick one of them. This happens to be from CNN. The title is, Trump praises Libyan General Haftar as his troops march on U.S.-backed government in Tripoli. So my question is, uh, what is the current U.S. position with regards to Libya? Are we supporting General Haftar, or are we supporting the current government of Libya? We continue to support political solution led by the U.N. Uh, Hassan Salome has been working to bring all sides of the parties to the table in order to find a way forward in, in Libya. As far as Haftar, 
over time, we've engaged with multiple parties in discussions recognizing how complex the situation is in Libya and how all parties need to be on board for a solution forward. Is the United States supporting General Haftar? The United States salute, supports a political solution in Libya. Okay, um, is it your understanding that Russia is supporting General Haftar? I would say General Haftar has supporters from the international community. Okay. Uh, do those supporters also include uh, United Arab Emirates? We have engaged with United Emirates in order to talk about a political solution, recognizing the way forward is through a coordinated effort in Libya. Um, is it your understanding that Russia and UAE have provided weapons to General Haftar? Sorry, I cannot speak to that. Okay. And um, are you aware or not if Saudi Arabia is supporting General Haftar? Again, sir, I cannot speak to that. Okay. Uh, after General Haftar's attack on the Libyan capital, the U.S. pulled some military forces out of Libya. Do we have any more U.S. forces in Libya? DOD removed its forces and has not returned them. I'm sorry, say that again? DOD removed its forces and has not returned them. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to um, end just this thing on Libya by saying I think it'd be good if Donald Trump and his State Department and Department of Defense got on the same page on Libya because I'm just reading the same facts you are and they're being conflicting signals sent by the President versus the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State. So I'd like to ask now about civilian casualties. The 2018 National Defense Authorization Act required an annual report on civilian casualties resulting from U.S. military operations. Congress has also directed DOD to develop a strategy for reducing casualties. At the same time, we're seeing a number of reports from non-governmental agencies that contradict the numbers from the Department of Defense. So my first question is, what methodology does DOD use to track and investigate civilian casualties, particularly in Africa? Okay. At the Department of Defense, we take civilian casualties extremely seriously. We take extraordinary measures in order to ensure that we avoid any harm to civilians in our operations. In the case of Somalia, um, we work closely with the partners as well as under the consent of the federal government of Somalia, and our attacks occur in Al-Shabaab areas which are normally secluded with low civilian populations. Um, anything as far as our practices, I would say I'd be more comfortable talking about in a classified environment. Uh, so if we could either get a classified briefing or a letter that sort of lays out the methodology DOD uses, would that be okay? Sir, I'll follow up with you on that. Okay. Um, what methods does DOD use to measure whether your efforts reduce civilian casualties or successful? We undergo extensive analysis within um, our planning before we undertake any kind of operation. And then afterwards, we continue to do a review of what occurred. We also welcome any reports from others as far as any allegations or concerns of civilian casualties, and we run those through, uh, through thorough reviews. We also continue to review practices to ensure that we're appropriately dealing with this in the best manner. We hold ourselves to a very high standard um, and continue to put Thank toward you. efforts. If I could ask execute. one last quick question. In the last two years, have civilian casualties uh, in Africa from U.S. forces, have they gone up or gone down or stayed the same? Sir, in the last year we published a 2018 CivCAS report. Within that, uh, we noted there's two civilian casualties which occurred in Somalia. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here. I want to uh, spend a little time focusing on the um, current uh, human rights situation in Zimbabwe. Uh, as I'm sure you know, Zimbabwe is a country that's experienced multiple challenges to democracy and human development. Uh, over the past two decades, and um, our government, as well as international human rights organizations, have documented disappearances, torture, killing, rape, and other acts of violence uh, committed by government agents uh, against its own citizens in Zimbabwe. And since the recent elections, live ammunition has been used against civilians uh, on two separate occasions, uh, resulting in, in multiple deaths. Uh, our government has consistently maintained a need for fundamental changes to occur before targeted economic measures uh, will be lifted from individuals in positions uh, of power in Zimbabwe. And I would encourage uh, my colleagues to join me uh, in a letter that I'm putting together, uh, reiterating the changes we would like to see 
to allow for Zimbabwe uh, uh, to head to a place that embraces human rights. So I have two questions uh, for the panel. Number one, uh, Zimbabwe continues to experience repressive violence targeted at stifling freedom of assembly. Uh, just this week, government actors targeted street vendors. Uh, across the continent, we've seen continued exceedingly harsh measures employed by government agents to discourage citizens from protesting. Uh, and my question is, what is the State Department uh, doing to encourage tolerance of freedom of assembly uh, across the continent, but specific to Zimbabwe? And second is, uh, during the January protests in Zimbabwe, uh, internet was suppressed for many days, uh, raising tensions as citizens both within and outside the country uh, were unable to uh, confirm the safety of, of their loved ones. Um, what measures uh, is, is the department uh, engaging in to encourage citizens uh, uh, that they're able to maintain communication, in particular, uh, as the UN has declared uh, access a basic human right uh, to aid uh, in accessing the freedom of opinion and expression. Thank you very much, Congressman. Zimbabwe is another one of those tragic, needless cases which is where the tragedies are purely uh, man-made. For me, it's very special because my kids were born in Zimbabwe. Uh, I had the same conversation with President Emengagwe at the United Nations in September, and I told him exactly what we were looking for if we want to start opening the door to better relations. I'll be going to Zimbabwe in a couple of weeks, and I look forward to having my next conversation with President Emengagwe because nothing much has happened since then. Uh, they keep coming to us saying that, well, Zimbabwe is open for business. We want to engage. We want to have better relations. Our point is there are two odious pieces of legislation which have been on the books. One specifically prevents public assembly, freedom of assembly. The other one is on freedom of expression. And before we can talk about anything else, those two pieces of legislation need to be either withdrawn or replaced by much more positive ones. Because until then, we're really not interested, despite so many people wanting to get back to doing trades and, and things like that. We just cannot. Uh, we appreciate the Zadera legislation because we can point to that. As you mentioned, sir, we've had a number of uh, specific sanctions. We hold that in reserve going into the future. So the United States of America is not going to warm relations with Zimbabwe until uh, they've been talking a good game. Let's actually see something that start improving the environment. Uh, recently in the, uh, in the most recent demonstrations where there was violence a couple of months ago, for the first time we had uh, evidence of Zimbabwe security forces using rape as a weapon of war. That is a road that we cannot allow the country to go down on. So we will maintain a very strong pressure on, th on there until there are actual concrete acts on their part. No question, sir, and, and the, the situations that we're being apprised of are horrific, including rape being used as a, as a tool of war, um, false imprisonment uh, of people who are just advocating for freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. Uh, there's one gentleman who I had the privilege of meeting, Pastor Ivan, uh, who is going to be um, um, detailed, uh, the details of that case in my letter. Uh, I'd really encourage you, sir, to look into that circumstance, look into those situations. If there's anything we can do on this committee uh, to advocate, please let us know. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sherman. Uh, Mr. Day, uh, hello. Um, we provide a fair amount of aid to Africa. One thing that occurs to me is that we should be providing textbooks, electronic or paper, uh, everywhere. Uh, first, it's pretty hard to steal a textbook. If you do steal textbooks, it's pretty hard to sell them if the United States is providing them in that country for free to the students. Um, and they, of course, could be electronic. I'm talking about all teaching materials. But in that way, while I'm not saying that the textbooks need to be written so that Berkeley, California school board would approve them, uh, they can reflect uh, 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 our values of democracy, uh, and freedom, openness, transparency. Um, I hope you'll take that under consideration. Thank you. We absolutely will. Education programs are at the core of what we do. Uh, so building and I, the next and generation. I, and I know in, in some countries, uh, parents are required to pay for the textbooks. And uh, 
Uh, that's one reason to either not send your kid to school or to send your kid to a madrasa if you happen to be in one of the countries where the Wahhabis are funding madrasas. Um, I hate to bring this up, man. The president uh, referred to the region we're talking about as a group of blank line whole countries. Uh, Ambassador Nagy, I'm sure that was not helpful uh, to our outreach to the peoples of Africa. Uh, and so the question is, what do we do to counterbalance that, erase it, by demonstrating to the people of Africa that America regards uh, their countries as important, vibrant, progressing, uh, a, an important part of, uh, of humankind's future. Um, one possibility is that the president goes to Africa. I know his relatives have gone. That has not been entirely successful. Uh, I'm not, I can't guarantee that the president would do uh, everything he should, should he go to Africa, but his mere appearance there uh, might demonstrate uh, that his administration uh, values uh, the continent. Uh, would that or anything else you can identify help uh, remove the taste in the mouth uh, in Africa of the unfortunate comments? Congressman, uh, in my visits to Africa, I've now visited, I think, 15 countries. I'm gonna visit five more. I have come across only genuine good feelings towards the United States of America. Um, what I keep telling Africans for look at America, by thy deeds thy shall be known, um, had nothing but positive interactions. I agree with you, high level visits to Africa are so welcome by our African friends and partners. Um, for the White House travel schedule, let, sir, let, 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 I, let, let, I refer let me move, you to the Let, let me move on to another question. Um, we see the debt trap system uh, that China is using. Of particularly concern is their possible control of the uh, Dora Le uh, container terminal in uh, 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 Djibouti, um, or the, their efforts to acquire same. And I'm thinking, working on legislation that would declare that certain debt trap instruments, the country would just be free not to pay. And they would not lose their credit rating. They would not lose their access to U.S. capital. It would be the, if it's a phony debt, just tear it up act. Uh, Ambassador Nagy, what do you think? Not being an economist, <laughs> I have to beg off, but I, I agree with you totally about the concern of the debt. Uh, what I mentioned before was we went through a whole decades of Africans owning incredible debt that had to be forgiven, and why go through that cycle again? Um, being sovereign countries, of well, course. Well, the, the, the Chinese don't forgive the debt, they take the port. We've yeah, seen that in Sri Lanka. We did. And we'll see that in Africa. We did. Um, up to now, uh, the Chinese have not seized any piece of state owned property in Africa, but that's not to say anything about the well, future. We just discovered this, so, this technique. So it is of concern, equal and, concern. And I'll point to out us. I mean, the question arises for any African country why repay the debt? The answer is because Western financial institutions will re won't loan you any more money if you default on debt. And if it's legitimate debt, fair debt, that's probably a good idea. Can I? But uh, but to have uh, the Chinese debt, uh, if you don't pay if you don't pay a bad Chinese instrument, we'd have to define that. Uh, that shouldn't hurt, affect your credit rating. Can uh, I give you a piece Ambassador? of good news? An American yes. company actually won a contract from the Chinese in Uganda for a three billion dollar refinery. They're doing it as equity, and it took a while to convince Ugandans of the advantage of that. But once they did, they said, "Wow." That's not incurring more debt. Uh, you're saying the Chinese are involved in this too? Okay. You, Americans, you, I, think, I think you misspoke. You said the Americans the, won it from the Chinese. Well, okay. We prevailed and got yes, the contract. Yes, we prevailed. Okay. So we didn't get it from the Chinese. We prevailed we over prevailed. the Chinese. We prevailed. Gotcha. Yes, sir. I believe my time has expired. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, first, thank you for your distinguished service to our country and to Texas in particular. Um, I want to go back to Cameroon. Uh, I share Chairwoman Bass's interest there. I have a number of Cameroon nationals in my district. Both of you ran out of time. You've mentioned that 
Uh, the government had established some Potemkin institutions. They weren't really doing anything to bring the two sides together. Could you elaborate on that? Because you ran out of time before. Sure, yes, sir. Uh, I understand the Cameroonian government established uh, several commissions, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact name of it, whether it's the Multicultural Institution for National Reconciliation or something, which on the face of it sounds good, but the institution, and, and there have been a couple of these, but they have not been provided adequate budget and they have not really done anything because what the country needs more than anything else is a genuine open dialogue probably to include the diasporas of the Cameroonians because they have a great deal of interest in this because sir what's happening both sides are becoming further and further radicalized uh, unfortunately I believe that the president of Cameroon is being told by his hardliners that he can win this thing militarily there is no way that they're going to win this militarily. The violence is going to get worse in the Northwest and the Southwest. Uh, the, the arm for an arm, literally an eye for an eye, and the whole world will be blind there. The violence will spread to the West Province. It may even spread to the Littoral Province, which is the large city of Douala. So, so there has to be something. We are very, very energetically uh, speaking with our allies. That's why I said that we just had in the Security Council this Monday a, what the United Nations calls an arias, where it's, a, it's an open debate, and it's so clear that everybody wants to move forward on this. Um, are sanctions on the table? Everything's on the table moving forward. But, but we have to bring this situation to an end, else the, there's a possibility of, of what happened in Nigeria with Boko Haram. It started as a small movement, and now look at it. And it'd be disastrous for the region if the Cameroonian government turned this thing into yet another type of Boko Haram. Or, or Boko Haram could come back into Cameroon. Uh, well, how do you, you mentioned, you know, that it, it appears to be spiraling out of control because the, the more the security forces clamp down, the more resistance there is on, in the Anglophone region. So what can we do that we're not already doing? Well, like I said, uh, the, the best we can do for right now is just work with our allies to really make the Cameroonian government understand the need for a real dialogue. And if that doesn't happen relatively quickly, then we have to look at the array of other tools we have in our toolkit uh, because, frankly, the possibility of sanctions is always there. It, but it's always better to work in concert with our our friends before we go in that direction because it is, it, it, the frustrating thing is it is in the interest of everybody to have a national dialogue. The situation will not end militarily. Each day the atrocities will get worse and worse. Is the permanent separation of the two regions a possibility? Sir, I don't believe so because I think that uh, most Cameroonians, including in the Southwest and Northwest, have a sense of Cameroonianness and the concept of the separated, uh, what they call Ambazonia, in my view, is not realistic. Okay. It is the view of the United States of America to recognize the integrity of the country of Cameroon. Got it. Thank you very much. Now you're back. Thank you very much, Ms. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I am troubled, as I think a number of people are, um, about China's expanding business interests in Africa, um, especially the manner in which they are expanding their business interests, um, including predatory lending um, and obtaining substantial collateral and leverage over African governments. Um, and, and specifically, this question has to do with access to um, minerals and natural resources. Um, and the one I'm particularly interested in is cobalt, which of course is important for electric cars. And we know that the DRC has an abundance of cobalt. I've heard reports that China has infrastructure agreements that essentially give it, China, monopolistic mining rights in the DRC. And I've also I also have come to understand that China has taken on an imperialistic approach through labor um, abuses and displacement of local workers in favor of Chinese nationals. Um, so before I go any further, I see a couple of nodding heads. Am I generally correct about what I've just said? 
it seems to be consensus. Ms. Linehan, do you agree? Okay. Um, and it's not a trick question. I just, you know, wanted to make sure that this was something that I understood correctly. What I would like to explore is how we make inroads in those markets and at the same time preserve, um, as somebody who is very labor-oriented and very, I'm on the Education and Labor Committee in addition to this, I'm not interested in only working on education and labor rights here in the United States, but making sure that we are not taking advantage of workers abroad and or that our employers, our United States employers, aren't doing so. So for any one of you, I, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on what we can do to, to at least compete with China. It, let's, and let's focus on the DRC right now. Thank you very much, Congresswoman, especially for focusing on the DRC, because there I think we have a real opportunity with new President Chisakedi, who since his inauguration has been doing a lot of the right things and saying the right things, and we remain very engaged with him. And he has said that he would prefer the United States of America to be his partner of choice. So if he pursues the right moves in fighting corruption, in leveling the business playing field, I know the U.S. business sector will be wildly enthusiastic to get back in there. I met with the, our, our business community when I was there. I met with business people here who are eager to get into China and specifically deal in some of those commodities you're talking about, cobalt, including the rare earths, because that's, that's another whole field. And, and, and this is, again, the thing with U.S. business investment. U.S. companies have so many positive practices, not just towards the environment, but towards labor, towards women's rights, uh, not paying bribes and things like that. This fits in squarely with President Chisakati's goals. Uh, we have to trust and verify and work hand in hand with him. But I am more optimistic about the Congo than I ever have been before in my life because this is a, this is a huge deal Again, U.S. businesses bring jobs. It's not the condition that everybody above turning a shovel is brought from another country. Right. And, and the Africans appreciate that. Even the dictators can look outside their doors and see the millions of young Africans without jobs who are angry. So they are just as eager to bring American companies that bring the jobs. So, so what, what can we do to encourage that? What can we do to help that process along and facilitate it? Mr. Day, you seem to want... Oh, go ahead. No. No, go ahead, Ramsey. I was just going to quickly add that, that we are active in this space in the DRC. We've been supporting the Responsible Minerals Trade Program for quite some time, and we've been able to validate over 450 mines in the DRC as, as conflict-free, which increases the level of, of, of transparency the, throughout the entire process. And so these are important programs to, to focus on, but I would also defer to the Assistant Secretary. No, exactly. I, with the Build Act, for example the support that we can give to U.S. businesses, having our embassies weaponized to aggressively support U.S. business, to set up the deal teams, to work with the host governments to tell them specifically what they can do to improve their business environment. This all works together. It requires a tremendous amount of energy, but it is well worth it. And I can assure you the U.S. business community is beyond uh, interested and excited about the possibilities that Africa offer. That's the sense that I have also. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks to the panel for being here. Um, Islamic extremist groups in Africa, uh, including Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, have caused problems, of course, for a long time. Wh which group uh, do you feel poses the greatest uh, threat? There are a significant number of terrorist groups operating in Africa and multiple parts of the of the continent. Uh, we have a priority effort in Somalia, where we've seen Al Shabaab uh, have a significant impact on the country. Although I would note that there is some progress that we're seeing in Somalia in a heartening way. Uh, we've seen the federal government of Somalia work with the federal member states, which is critical for political progress. We've seen the return of our embassy back to Mogadishu for the first time since the 1990s. So although progress is slow in Somalia, we are in fact seeing it 
But there are also other groups of concern across the continent. We've talked about the Sahel here today. So you have both Al Qaeda and ISIS affiliates operating there uh, with increasing gains and, um, and other nodes throughout. Yes, uh, S Somalia has been fragile and violent for more than 25 years. What more should the U.S. be doing? Any, any comments? Please, Mr. Ambassador. Sure. Um, exactly right, Congressman. That has been one of my biggest frustrations. <laughs> In 2002, when I left as ambassador to Ethiopia, Somalia was a mess. There was an Islamic radical group called al Tiad. I come back 20-some years later, Somalia is still a mess. The Islamic radical group is called Al-Shabaab. Billions of dollars spent since then. Luckily, now, for the first time, I, I think we have the opportunities to make real progress. We have an extremely talented ambassador on the ground in Mogadishu, Ambassador Don Yamamoto, who engages constantly, continuously with the Somali government. We have what I feel like is a, three, a real uh, 3D approach there to where we're working very closely together and with the Somali government, very dynamic prime minister, uh, Maybe, maybe this time it really will happen. I don't want somebody else to come back here in 20 years and face the same situation. Does it concern you, I, I believe def, the DOD is planning a 10% reduction in special forces deployed to, the, to, the, uh, to Africa. Is, is that a problem? Honest to goodness, Congressman, I don't believe so because to me, part of that, and of course, I'll turn it over to my colleague to, to address it more clearly. I think part of that is it, actually based on some successes, for example, in northern Cameroon, uh, working with the Cameroonians. And, and if I looked at the total number of exercises and DOD activities in Africa last year, they were actually larger in number than, than the year before. Um, That's all I know. We will obviously work together with whatever resources we're given to make sure that they're optimally uh, used and to effectiveness. So from my point of view, that's a decision for DOD and we will work with our partners the best way possible. Yeah, thank you. I can add to that to say that the majority of our activities in Africa are not affected. We are engaged in a robust level through multiple tools, which I referenced in, in my opening comments. Um, some adjustments that we've made are CT focused specifically, and as Ambassador Naj mentioned, oftentimes there are in areas where we've already seen success and our partners have uh, matured through those programs, and so they're coming to an, a natural end. Um, but we'll continue to review whatever decisions we make. We constantly review our activities and our posture uh, in order to react to conditions on the ground and ensure we've got the best way forward working in conjunction with state and our other partners in the U.S. government. Okay. Um, to the best of your knowledge, is Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, is that AQIM organization affiliated and um, interconnected with Al-Qaeda in Iraq or in the Middle East? AQIM is an Al-Qaeda affiliate, so it is part of the larger organization. Uh, we also have seen some consolidation of Al-Qaeda-related groups into something called JNIM, which is operating within the Sahel. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I yield my time. Representative Allred. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the chairman for holding this hearing today and y'all for coming up here. Uh, I think it's critical that we not ignore Africa and, and that we counter uh, Chinese and Russian influence in Africa. And I want to commend many of our efforts uh, through USAID and the State Department to stabilize and support institutions in Africa, in particular, of course, the PEPFAR program which is created by my constituent, uh, President George W. Bush. Um, however, I do have some concerns uh, with the administration's approaches, including uh, the recognition of the fraudulent election outcome in the DRC, a watering down of the UN sexual violence uh, resolution, and of course, the budget cuts that were this committee had a hearing on not long ago that uh, were rejected, of course, out of hand. Uh, and, and I want to, to turn to some comments after the administration's national security strategy, which portrays Chinese influence as undermining African development by, quote, corrupting elites, dominating extractive industries, and locking countries into unsustainable and opaque debts and commitments. I agree with that assessment. Um, but the administration's intention uh, to counter that appears to be through bilateral actions. I think 
one of our strengths that's unique to the United States is our ability to engage multilateral uh, allies to engage in whatever the issue is. And I just want Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Ms. Lenahan, if you could, uh, to address why we are approaching this through bilateral communications and, and actions instead of to the UN and, and some of our allies in the region. Congressman, uh, as I said earlier, I've worked through seven different administrations, and each administration has its own uh, unique priorities and their approaches to how to do business. Uh, not that one is, you know, any better than the other. They're different. Uh, the priorities for this administration is doing things bilaterally, and that can work just as well as doing things multilaterally. Uh, some efforts are more effective one way, other efforts are more effective the other way. We maintain a very robust engagement with the African Union. For example, this conference that we've uh, organized for tomorrow afternoon on Sudan, uh, the African Union is both sending a representative from Addis and uh, they will be uh, teleconferencing from Khartoum where their expert is engaged directly. So uh, we engage with African states bilaterally. We also engage at the sub-regional level. In all of my visits to the con continent, uh, I have uh, visited ECOWAS. I visited EGAD uh, during my trip to East Africa. So it, it, it's a dual track approach. We, as I've said, we've also support very strongly the continent-wide free trade agreement. So it's, it, it's a bit of both. Uh, we'll do whatever uh, is the most effective, sir. Okay, well, I wanna move on and uh, talk about the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, that's now including a digital Silk Road uh, through which some, some countries in Africa have been emboldened, I'm particularly thinking of Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Uganda, to increase surveillance on their citizens, um, including members of the political opposition. So, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Day, uh, what are the implications of the expansion of this digital um, Chinese influence uh, in Africa, and what plans do we have uh, to protect civic and political space in Africa from being eroded by the surveillance culture that China is attempting to export? Sir, it's obviously very negative, the impacts of, of that uh, activity. We, at the embassy level, at the ambassador level, uh, definitely engage with the governments, tell them uh, of the disadvantages and w the vulnerabilities that they will have. Uh, in some cases, we've had to ask the government to take the cameras down that faced our embassies and other embassies have done the same thing. Uh, some governments are receptive. Unfortunately, other governments are not. At the end of the day, it's a sovereign decision on their part. We regret very much uh, what is going on, and hopefully people will realize the vulnerabilities that they're opening up to themselves. Uh, Congressman, I would just add that, that we are also working with our uh, partners at our level to ensure that uh, there's a level of awareness of the risks, um, particularly to American investment on the continent, um, to ensure that there's a, an understanding that American companies are going to be very uh, reluctant to engage yes. um, in trade and investment with a particular country if they have built their infrastructure on the, their digital infrastructure uh, in this way. And the, it, it seems to resonate, um, but in many cases they may not have many options. Yeah. Um, and we're certainly sensitive to that, but um, we're certainly trying to raise awareness of, of some of the risks through this. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Levin. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for your leadership uh, in this area. You know, I feel like uh, the U.S. pays much less attention to Sub-Saharan Africa than, than it should, and this is a problem of long standing. So it was great to hear all of your passion and commitment and knowledge uh, this morning. Uh, I want to start with a question on uh, Somalia for Ms. Lenahan. Uh, the U.S. has dramatically increased airstrikes to counter al-Shabaab in Somalia since April of 2017. Uh, we carried out more airstrikes in Somalia in the last nine months of 2017 than in the five years from 2012 to 2016. Then there were 47 in 2018 and almost 30 just in the first quarter of 2019, as far as I can find out. Um, until recently, the administration claimed that U.S. strikes had not caused any civilian deaths in Somalia during this period. However, last month, AFRICOM acknowledged 
two, that two civilians had in fact been killed by a U.S. strike in 2018, and Amnesty International and other third parties have provided credible evidence of additional civilian casualties that are not accounted for in the U.S. government's assessments. So Ms. Lenahan, my question is why are AFRICOM's official assessment, assessments of civilian casualties uh, so much lower than the assessments provided by credible third parties? And thank you, Representative, for your question. Uh, our strikes are one component of a broader approach that we take within Somalia. Uh, civilian casualty is something that we consider a very grave situation. It's something that has significant senior leadership attention in the Department of Defense. Um, Any time. But so I have very little time. So sure, can you sure, answer sure, my question? Why are they, they different? Of course. So we welcome any information that we find from other groups. Amnesty International, we've actually engaged with them. My team has met with them, as well as in AFRICOM. We take that information under review. We do our own analysis and so forth. And based on our information and what they've provided, we have a different perspective on the numbers. Well, but isn't it true that AFRICOM launched an internal review in part because of Amnesty's report? And you found that uh, 2018 airstrikes targeting Al Shabaab did kill two civilians. That was you, that was acknowledged, right? There were two, and that's a fact that had not been previously disclosed. So, our combatant commands are constantly reviewing our best practices as well as their information. Africom did undergo an additional review. It did find out um, information All right, regarding so it's, two it's true. casualties. Uh, yeah. Yes. And All right. Well, I would just encourage you to be transparent and. Uh, I'm very concerned about civilian casualties. I, I also want to ask a question about a very different subject to Mr. Day, and that is uh, climate change. Um, in the span of less than two months, we saw cyclones Edai and Kenneth hit southeastern Africa, and with them, hundreds of deaths and tens of thousands of people displaced. The New York Times reported that this was the first time that two cyclones had struck Mozambique in the same season ever. What is the U.S. government doing to improve the Mozambique, Mozambican government's response to such incidents and increase the resilience of the local population to extreme weather events, which seem like they'll happen more and more frequently? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. The, 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 these, of course, were uh, devastating events, uh, particularly Cyclone Ide in, in, in Berna. Um, we've had a longstanding um, and good relationship with the government of Mozambique, but a lot of our programs, particularly in Barra, and, and as you go further north, have really been focused on HIV uh, and AIDS work, so PEPFAR and, and PMI, the President's Malaria Initiative, have been right. active up there. Um, we have not had many programs uh, in that area of the country. A lot of our programs have been in the south where more of the population centers have been. Um, so we haven't had uh, programs up to date when it comes to kind of disaster response, but we have had a lot of programs that are related towards um, uh, food security and, and stabilization and resilience type work, which does kind of impact uh, some of those issues. Well, I'm afraid you're going to need to have more um, there and, <laughs> and elsewhere. Let me, let me just ask you a broader question. Uh, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa have, ver have spotty electricity grids and coverage and other energy coverage. There's a huge opportunity here to help the countries of sub-Saharan Africa leapfrog ahead and use renewable energy technologies like solar and wind and geothermal to provide uh, power to their people. Uh, and it could be, play a huge role in combating climate change. So I'm curious, my time's expired, but I'll let you answer and then I'll turn it back over, Madam Chairwoman. I would just quickly say that Power Africa has an all of the above uh, approach. So they work on solar, they work in wind, they work in, in, in a variety of different sectors in, in the power sector. Couldn't agree more. Um, um, and so it, it, it's, um, it's an area that I think will transform many of these areas. Um, the, the in Power Africa 2.0, we are transitioning that strategy to not just in generation, but also in transmission. We've learned that if you just focus on generation, but you don't have the transmission infrastructure, then it's not going to work. So we're focusing more on the transmission side as well, but all, right. all of the above. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience, Madam Chairwoman. Absolutely. Representative Hulan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, this question is for Ambassador Naji. Um, I was wondering if you might happen to recognize the name Christopher Allen.
So uh, Christopher Allen is the name of an American citizen and freelance journalist who was killed by South Sudanese forces reporting on the conflict in, conflict in South Sudan, Sudan less than two years ago, and he's from around my community just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, he was 26 at the time of his death, and his parents, as you can imagine, uh, continue to be heartbroken and frustrated by the fact that there really doesn't appear to be any accountability at this point in time for his tragic murder. And I was hoping, if you, since you are not familiar with him, would please, for the record, be able to prepare an update, uh, a statement for us of what has transpired uh, regarding his case so that the State Department can be helpful in working to obtain justice for Mr. Allen. Absolutely, Congresswoman. I promise you that I will look into it. Now that I know the name, which happened, of course, before I came here, absolutely. The, lo the loss of American citizens, um, tragedy beyond words, and I will look into it and get that back to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. His family really is quite heartbroken, and I think they very much feel unheard, and I think it would be really helpful in this new world order if you have the opportunity to look into that for us. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Day and Ms. Lin Linehan, and, and as you are aware, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, just up the, up the dais, the Women, Peace, and Security Act became law in 2017, and we are expecting the required strategy to be re released any day now from Congress. Uh, as we know, it was due in October of 2018. And given the current youth bulge in many African countries, I think it's more important than ever, as we talked about, to increase the efforts to support girls and girls' education, to eliminate child marriage, uh, and to provide women comprehensive reproductive health services. Can you tell me a little bit about how you are using the 2011 uh, Women's uh, Peace and Security Act and what you were doing in anticipation of the release of this other act? Thank you. Um, thank you. I noted this is a topic that I believe strongly in and the Department of Defense strongly supports as well. In my opening remarks, I noted one example, which is Operation Flintlock, uh, which is a CT, I'm sorry, a special operations force exercise where we have a women peace and security seminar which we've done since 2017 other examples um, in Tunisia we actually have training all female training for Intel and then another example I can cite is certain times with our um, education programs to in order to provide incentives for greater female participation a country may get an additional slot if a woman is offered mr. day Thank you for the question. Uh, again, this is uh, something that USAID has really woven into uh, many, if not all, of our programs. We call it a cross-cutting issue of is engaging women into, into our programs, women and girls, um, as well as youth. Um, I, I think one example would be in Kenya, um, it, where the Masoni microfinance um, um, organization partnered with, uh, with Dow DuPont to create a microfinance uh, in facility in which over 5,300 microfinance loans were, were issued throughout um, agricultural producers throughout the country. 83% of them went to women. And so this is something that is, is near and dear, I think, to the heart of USAID because, as I said earlier, um, Africa is not going to progress in its development uh, uh, progress and without the participation of women at all levels, um, through the economy, through the political uh, system, and all, certainly through the educational system as well. So this is part and parcel of what we do. And I serve on the Africa subcommittee as well and really have a deep passion for women and girls in particular. I really think that 51% of our population on the planet really deserves a better shake. And I think that we have a responsibility as a nation who leads to make sure that we're doing that. I'm pretty disappointed that we that we struggle with this particular situation and that things are, are consistently late in this area. I really appreciate your, your passion for it as well. Uh, I, I have only 45 seconds left, and I just was wondering from you, Mr. Day, if you could give me a little bit of an update. I know you spoke a bit about the DRC, and you talked a bit about, about the Ebola outbreak and that it wasn't uh, under control, but are there any lessons that we have learned that could be further institutionalized in order to improve this issue in the international community? I'm sorry, I only have about a half a minute. We are continuing to, to learn lessons as we go. We certainly learned a lot of lessons in the 2014 West Africa outbreak, and we've been applying a lot of those lessons um, in this particular outbreak. There's a huge difference uh, between the two in that the, the operating environment is just so difficult. It is so complex. Um, but we're certainly learning that community engagement is absolutely must be at the core of what we're doing because the community distrust that we're seeing, which has nothing to do really from this particular outbreak, this is longstanding uh, traumatic issues, marginalization, um, 
predatory behavior by the previous government. Um, so these are major, major issues, and the, but the community engagement element of this is absolutely critical. So we will certainly take that with us um, it, if and when there is another outbreak as well. Thank you, and I have run out of time. I also would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Representative Abigail Spanberger for yielding her time to me. I yield back. Representative Spanberger. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to our witnesses today. Uh, Ms. Lenahan, I'd like to start with a question for you. Earlier this year, General Waldhauser testified that AFRICOM has not been granted, quote, offensive strike capabilities or authorities, end quote, outside of Libya and Somalia. However, the administration reported to Congress in 2018 that it considered two Islamic State affiliates in Western Africa to be legal targets under the 2001 AUMF. My question is, in which countries does DOD assess it has the authority to use military force, whether currently engaged in hostilities or not, and under which authorities is it operating? As General Waldhauser noted, our two areas where we have direct strike um, actions are in Libya and Somalia. Under both of those accounts, it's under the AUMF. And are there other engagements in other portions of Africa uh, that are falling outside of those two named locations? No, we only conduct direct strikes in Libya and Somalia. Thank you. Um, and, and pivoting and further discussing Somalia, um, we have dramatically increased our airstrikes in Somalia. We have hundreds of troops on the ground, and according to DOD reports, we have forces that regularly use self-defense. We, we've seen this escalation over the last three presidential administrations. It's not limited to party or, or anything else, but, but I do find these uh, shifts um, something that we within this committee should be talking about. Do you assess that we're seeing a slippery slope of engagement or mission creep in Somalia, and do you expect U.S. military presence and the use of force to increase further um, as, as time continues? We've seen some successes and some gains in Somalia, so I'd say although it's a, a long slog there, we've definitely seen some um, notes of optimism. We recently hosted Prime Minister Kyrie at the Pentagon where he talked about some of the economic reforms in order to uh, pursue debt relief and so forth, also noting how security efforts are helping create that time and space in order for development and diplomacy efforts to take hold and to grow. So I would say, although Somalia is a difficult environment, we are on a positive trajectory there. Um, and that our defense activities are just one part of a much broader USG effort. As we've noted for the first time, our US embassy has returned there. USAID is heavily engaged with a high degree of activity. Um, we've also seen some other areas of improvements, so direct payments to soldiers in order to reduce corruption, as well as biometric registration um, of weapons in order to increase accountability. So the Somalis are taking some really tough steps in order to build out their institutions, build out that infrastructure, and ultimately take responsibility for their own security. Thank you, Ms. Lanahan. Uh, as a former CIA officer, I believe very deeply in the counterterrorism efforts um, of our country, of and, and, and the nature of that as a, as a really um, uh, multifaceted approach. I also now, as a member of Congress, uh, remain deeply concerned that we're continuing to operate under the 2001 AUMF um, that has been expanded and, and broadened over time. Initially, it was focused on, on those who, uh, who perpetrated the, the um, this night, September 11th attack. So I do note that for the record because it is something that I am very focused on. But I, I'd like to continue a bit. Ambassador Naj, given the 2018 Stabilization Assistance Review placed um, uh, the, the State Department squarely in the lead. Um, are you being consulted when the military does broaden the scope of military targets or, or does endeavor to escalate the force um, in Somalia or Libya? Uh, on Libya, I can't uh, address that. That's out of my uh, area of operations. But in Somalia, um, what we are doing with this, uh, our embassies have to give us their in individual analysis in July so that we can look at it continent-wide and see where we stand, and it'll become an annex, uh, an, a strategy that we will look at together okay. just to further our working relationship. So I'm, I'm encouraged by this process going forward. We very much needed this. Thank you. And Thank you. If I could add to that, we work in close cooperation with the State Department on our overarching approach and how the security element fits into our broader U.S. objectives. 
Thank you. And one quick question for Mr. Day. Um, it, it seems that we're all in agreement that, that counterterrorism efforts need to uh, unite defense, diplomatic, and development efforts. Are, are there any other um, comments that you would make regarding how the United States can improve the capacity of African countries to prevent, mitigate, uh, to prevent and mitigate uh, radicalization and violence um, so that we can get ahead of military engagement? I, I, you probably need another 20 minutes for that, sir. <laughs> Maybe so. We look at it from both bottom up and top down. So we certainly need uh, good partners, um, and we have some good partners on the African continent. Um, in some cases, we don't have as good of partners. So in those cases, we really have to work from the, from the bottom up, and that really starts with local communities. It starts with, just like it does in any country. It starts with local leaders, local politicians, um, local chiefs, and, and tribal leaders. And so um, having that ground game is absolutely critical. Um, now, in an ideal world, you can do both, um, but in some cases, we don't have that environment. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for letting us run over to witnesses. Thank you. Sure. Representative Phillips, I think you might be closing us out. <laughs> it, we'll it would look like that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I echo my now departed colleagues' uh, gratitude to our witnesses for appearing today uh, and the collective sentiment uh, about elevating Africa amongst our priorities here on this committee. Uh, I think we would all agree that foreign assistance uh, is a pillar of our national security strategy. It should be, uh, especially as it relates to addressing the root causes of extremism and instability uh, around the world. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, Section 385 of the 2017 NDAA empowers the Secretary of Defense to transfer up to $75 million uh, to agencies such as USAID and the Department of State uh, to implement foreign assistance programs, including conflict mitigation, good governance, and peace building uh, to address the root causes of violence and instability. Uh, my question is for you, Ms. Lenahan, uh, and can you tell me if the Secretary of Defense has used that authority? And thank you, one, for the Section 385 authority. To, it gives us greater flexibility in order to address some of the issues on the continent. We've certainly explored possibilities and considered programs, um, and we'd like to implement that at some point, but at present we don't have a 385 uh, program ongoing. Okay, so, so, so nothing has been transferred. Uh, can, can you share about something about the programs that you're considering or ways that it could be deployed? We've looked at it in the maritime concept. We've also looked at it within the Sahel. Um, there are some legal complications and so forth that we have to work through, but we're intent on creating a program in order to exercise that authority. Okay. Um, I I speak for myself, but I'm sure other committee members too, and that um, you know, it was allocated for a reason and we'd sure like to see it deployed, especially considering the challenges uh, that we face and the, the good uses uh, uh, for it. Um, Mr. Day, I'd like to turn my next question to, uh, uh, in my district, uh, Cargill is based in, in my district, the third district in Minnesota, uh, another uh, number of other companies that help feed the world. Uh, wondering how the private sector and, and companies can better engage with USAID, uh, perhaps with the help of Congress, uh, to do better to, uh, by more people, uh, especially in Africa. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the private sector um, is, is absolutely critical to, I think, the administrator's vision for the future of USAID. Um, we have a private sector engagement approach policy uh, that we're now implementing. Um, we're, we're looking at this through the lens of we will never have enough resources to meet the need on the African continent. But if we can leverage what we're doing and if we can partner with the private sector, then I think we can mobilize so much more capital, move so much more capital onto the continent for the benefit of both African but also American companies such as Cargill and others. Um, we've, we've done this already in, with programs like Feed the Future, mm -hmm. um, but we want to take that even, we want to take that to scale, um, which is why we're, we're, we're rolling out the Prosper Africa initiative. So, Agriculture, because the African continent is still very much an agrarian uh, economy, agriculture and of course health, um, digital econ di digital e-commerce is still going to be. These are going to be, I think, pillars of the Prosper Africa approach. But that engagement and that leveraging of American, uh, uh, the American private sector, we think is a superior value proposition on the continent, which of course counters the influences of China. It helps African development. It creates American jobs. And so this is why this is such a priority for us. Wonderful. Uh, so why don't we close just, uh, I'd like each of you maybe to take 20, 30 seconds and just express uh, to us you know, how this committee uh, might support efforts in Africa. If you could wave a magic wand uh, and implore that we do something, uh, maybe starting with you, Mr. Ambassador, what might we do uh, expeditiously uh, 
uh, and helpfully. I greatly appreciate these kinds of opportunities to just publicize for the larger public as to what is going on in Africa and the importance of Africa so that we can articulate that and also to show that the partnerships that we have together, that there really is a whole of government approach there. And then the tremendous things that, uh, for example, we talked earlier about the BUILD Act, mm -hmm. uh, Zadera, you know, these types of other acts which are coming out which make our jobs much, much easier because, like, for example, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, I can point directly to, the, to Zadera and say, no, we can't uh, you know, open up greater relations until you do X, Y, and Z. So your support in that regard is just phenomenal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Day? I, I couldn't agree more with the Assistant Secretary. This, this relationship um, is absolutely critical to our success uh, on the continent, whether it's AGOA, um, or the, the chairman and the ranking member's uh, legislation on championing American business for the Diplomacy Act, um, or the Electrify Africa Act. I mean, these are all yeah. in support of direct goals of, of USAID and, and, and transcend any administration. So we certainly appreciate the, the tremendous support. Thank you, Mr. Day. Maybe a final comment, Ms. Lenahan? Well, as a testament to the synchronization of our efforts, I'll agree with my colleagues and just note uh, highlighting the importance of Africa, highlighting the great work that USAID and State Department are doing on the ground, continuing to maintain a focus on it certainly is helpful. And I appreciate the opportunity from this committee in order to discuss it today and into the future. Great. Well, thank you all, and I yield back. Well, let me uh, just conclude by thanking uh, our three witnesses for enduring the hearing today. Uh, it was, oh, we've... <laughs> I did just get a message to sprint from the Transportation Committee, and I guess Representative this is just Representative Malinowski. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you for fitting me in in the last second. Um, so a lot of things I could ask you guys about, but I, I wanted to focus on a country that I visited, I think, four times in my last year as an Assistant Secretary of State, and that's Ethiopia. Um, and I know it's a country near and dear to your heart, Ambassador. Uh, in, in 2016, uh, this is an authoritarian state that was going through turmoil, potential transition, uh, and we worked incredibly hard to try to promote the democratic transition that the country sorely needed. And now here we are looking at perhaps the most promising democratic transition of any country in the world, I, I would say. Um, and I'm glad that you agree, but my question um, really to all of you is what are we doing to seize the moment? Because, and I know that there are engagements and just this week you guys are, at least at your level, um, uh, talking to a wide range of Ethiopian officials but this seems to me to be a case that, that, that calls for a much more dramatic uh, increase in U.S. engagement at all levels. Um, I know it's above your pay grade, but I mean, this, I, I, I would much rather see the Ethiopian Prime Minister in the Oval Office than Viktor Orban of Hungary, given <laughs> the values of this country. Um, so I just want to challenge you all on, on this to, to tell us what are we doing to significantly step up our engagement and support um, for Ethiopia? And, and how are we uh, marrying that, in, that, what I hope will be a significant increase with continued encouragement to move down this path? Can I start on this one, guys, and I'll turn to, thank you very much, Congressman, for that question. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see what's happening this week at the State Department, but we have the Ethiopia Partnership Forum going on with a high-level delegation from Ethiopia, and lines around the block of U.S. business people in the Ethiopian diaspora to get in to engage with these high-level officials as to what they can do for Ethiopia, how they can invest in Ethiopia, what are the sectors of investment. Because Ethiopia has come to the point where there are a couple of things that they desperately need. One is the Prime Minister's grand vision to transform Ethiopia into a true state of institutions. With that goes, they're, they're working on everything. It's like everything's a priority. And unfortunately, in one of those situations where everything is a priority, it's very difficult for us to fill all the gaps. That's one. But then what they need more than anything else, and very quickly, are jobs. And the Prime Minister himself has articulated that. In that regard, 
I don't think anybody can bring more money into the picture than U.S. businesses and other responsible businesses because they're the ones that create jobs, not the, not the Chinese infrastructure projects. Right after the change started, I remember coming over and sitting down with, uh, with Ramsey and uh, Administrator Green to ask exactly what can the United States do to very quickly respond to their needs. And it has to be triage because our resources, frankly, are not limited. So many of them are tied up that we can't just all of a sudden put tremendous funds together. Uh, we're working uh, continuously comparing notes with Ambassador Mike Rayner. We're so fortunate to have one of our best ambassadors in the world in Ethiopia to see uh, where we can go quickly, whether it's sending a, uh, a, a technical expert to the Ethiopian bank or to this ministry or that ministry. They've created brand new ministries. Um, they want to have relationships across the board. They want to open up all sectors of the economy. It's, uh, it's an incredible opportunity, but it's also an incredible challenge to figure out where the United States can bring its best value added. Let me, let me actually, because I only have 46 seconds, so oh. one quick question for you and one for you, Ms. Lenahan. Um, the, the, the former draconian charities proclamation is, has been, my understanding, replaced with a new more liberal structure. Yes. Are, are we taking advantage of this to do what we could not have done before um, and, and, and to begin to work more directly with Ethiopian civil society organizations? Are we testing that space? And then to you, Ms. Lenahan, can you assure me that DOD and its mill-to-mill -mill engagements is making it crystal clear there can be no going back given that the, you know, the security institutions in Ethiopia, I must imagine, were not entirely friendly to this uh, transition. Um, some of them have to be removed from the intelligence apparatus, and, and there's always this risk of dual messaging. Can you assure me of that? V very quickly, yes, both at the embassy level and here. Tomorrow I'm meeting with a group of UN NGOs who are very interested in Ethiopia. So we will promote that to the best of our ability. Including assistance? Yes. Okay. And I note on the defense front, we are thrilled by the changes that are occurring in Ethiopia and the new opportunities that that proposes. I was able to lead our bilateral engagement uh, with the Minister of Defense. We had 16 lines of effort in order to try to embrace them and, and through engagement really ensure those positive practices that you've noted and that there would be no backsliding to the point where I actually think we're, we're saturating what they can absorb. Uh, so we're trying to manage that. But Ethiopia is also stepping up. They're, they're leading justified or exercise justified accord this summer, taking a leadership uh, role within the region. And so we're certainly working with them on institution building all the way through things like exercises. Thank you so much. Thank you. Representative Omar. Thank, thank you, Chairwoman Bass. Um, so I just wanted to uh, really get into this um, horrific reign of, of terror uh, and its spread in, in Africa. Um, and, you know, we... Um, oftentimes are really dealing with, with this issue um, and it seems like we are attempting to drone it to death. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, what um, the particular assessment has been because we know that in Somalia, particularly in dealing with uh, Al-Shabaab, since um, President Trump um, has gotten elected, the number of drones have increased, but the number of attacks that Al-Shabaab has been able to carry out has also tripled. Um, we also know the same to be true for Boko Haram, and I'm just wondering what, um, where do we go from here and, and what the solution really should be. Um, thank you for your question. I just know the Department of Defense employs a broad spectrum of activities and engagements across the continent. Our direct strikes is actually a very small component of what we do. I noted earlier in, in my discussion, the testimony, we work on building partnership capacity. We do security cooperation, training and equipping, but also working to um, employ medical expertise as well as um, women, peace, and security, and so forth. So it's really a broad spectrum of what we do. In the case of Somalia, we also have a broad approach, which we have building the, the DANAB, which is an advanced infantry brigade, in order to provide 
security for people in Somalia, high level of protection. We've seen great results from that. We also work as a coordinating function in order to ensure international donors' contributions are being used as effectively without duplication as they can. In the case of our um, strikes, I would say that we take ultimate extraordinary lengths to ensure that we reduce any kind of civilian harm and that we're working in coordination with our partners to include the federal government of Somalia to ensure that it is in line with what their broader approach is on a full spectrum of economic, political, and so forth. Uh, we're trying to maintain pressure on the network in order that we can create that time and space. And we have seen some improvements in Somalia, as we've noted um, before, you know, just some of the economic reforms that are ongoing. We've seen the Somalis take greater responsibility as far as joint operations in Lower Shabeli in order to expand uh, the safety zone within, within outside of Mogadishu. And additionally, I just note that you see increased um, air flights coming in, commercial flights coming into Mogadishu. You see Maersk using the port. So there are some real gains that have been uh, made. In, in, in that breath, do you see uh, senti sentiments within um, the Somali community changing against Al-Shabaab? Or should we reassess the way that we are dealing with Al-Shabaab? I mean, maybe the ambassador can take that one. That I, I, I and wish if you can I be could brief, answer. I have few more questions. Sure, I wish I wish I could answer that. I I honestly don't know. Um, the the crux of the matter is the three of us can work together perfectly well, but we need that fourth partner, which is a willing and capable government in place. Uh, the first day on the job, I talked about Somalia, and I asked, how many forces does Al-Shabaab have? How many forces does the Somali National Army and uh, Amisom and the federal member states have? Based on the numbers alone, it should be no contest. Mm -hmm. but, but you need to have that willingness and that capability in the partner. Hopefully now we're getting to the point we have it. Yeah. I, I just spoke with Ambassador Yamamoto last uh, week. Uh, so. I so let me ask you this follow-up question. It's, it seems like that there is a, a direct sort of uh, correlation between um, our, our droning and the increase of, of their assaults, um, and their, their recruitment seems to um, increase because of, of some of the civilian casualties that, that might take place. And so how do we mitigate that? What, what is our strategy to make sure that the people are on our side and that they are partners in helping us fight terror? And again, I'd note that we have a, a broad approach and that strikes are just one minor component of it. I think one of the greatest issues in Somalia is just people, governance, people feeling as if the government is taking care of them, they're providing services and so forth. So as the federal government of Somalia expands its own capabilities and its reach, I think then you're going to have the greatest impact on eliminating the attractiveness of al-Shabaab, in addition to the security efforts that we're employing to in alignment with our partners, both Amazon as well as other partners, in order to try to create that Somali national security architecture so that the Somalis, again, can expand the, the sense of control that they have over the government, or over the country. I, I would just like to, and one thing I would really like to do, I'm looking forward to doing, I'm eager to d do my next domestic outreach up to uh, M Minnesota to do outreach with the Somali diaspora, because I have found in my experience that it's extremely useful to engage directly with the diasporas to see if there are any other ideas or other reflections on, on how things can be done. Yeah, I think that that probably would be very much welcomed. I, you know, in, in your earlier testimony, testimonies, all of you talked about the partnership that needs to happen in order for us to have a greater influence in Africa. And I would um, be remiss if I didn't say that as an African on, on this committee, uh, when you have a president who um, uses language like shithole countries, it makes it really hard for people in Africa to sort of think themselves as being partnership with the United States. And so I hope that we are um, in the business of, of developing better relationships. We're in the business of um, really looking at the language that we use um, to, to describe these nations that have great potential, that are just looking for a partnership, and that's where America really can, can shine. So thank you, I yield back. Wonderful. Um, I want to close us out on that note and also reference that in our subcommittee on Africa, we would like to follow up and have you come back. This committee's adjourned.